If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe. Special thank you to Landmark Coffee Roasters, a sponsor for this podcast. If you haven't tasted their coffee, you've got to go check it out. Some of the best beans in Southern California, landmarkroasters.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Chi in the Stoke House. All right. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Dennis, you are one of the Mexico brothers. We lived in Mexico together for four months mm-hmm. in a pastor and training school under John Corson. Yeah. And you were one of my favorite guys on the planet. You were pastor at one of the largest Korean American churches in Los Angeles mm-hmm. for many years. You are passionate about Jesus and you have great insight into his word. You are an LA native. Yeah. Like you know this town. <laughs> um, you have been a counselor to me. You've been a brother to me. You've been a friend to me all these years. You knew me back when I had hair and a beard. <laughs> um, from then to becoming a pastor, to getting married, to planting a church in LA, you prayed for me when I had no kids, and now I have three. Praise God. I know. You are a leader in the church and in our culture. You've had prophetic words for me that have impacted my life forever. You introduced me to some of the best foods in Los <laughs> Angeles. And you made fun of me when I thought California rolls were sushi. I know, bro. You, oh my gosh. <laughs> you had a teacher. The tempura <laughs> is not sushi, okay? That's just fried rice. Classic 909 right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but you're also a musician. You love to pick up the guitar and sing worship from time to time. Uh, if I could have an ounce of you and Josh Sisko's style, I'd be doing pretty good. Oh, man. Uh, you are married to Rej. Yep. And you have two beautiful kids. You're a good husband. You're a good father. Katie and I are very thankful for you and Rej. Mm. Dude, welcome to the show. Hey, man, Josh, that's too much. Thank you. I, <laughs> I didn't know you thought of all that, but yeah. hey, we do go back. I'm glad to be on the show with you, and we're going to just see where the Lord takes us on this one. So, <laughs> yeah. No, this is, this is easy for me, Dan. This is like because I was just telling the guys like before we started the show, because we go so far back um, in our early 20s, um, well, I was in my early 20s. Yeah, same and, here. And... Uh, and we met in Mexico, and we were these foolish young kids yeah. trying to just pursue Jesus with all of our heart. And uh, we ended up really uh, dumping all of the, I don't know how to say it, the darkest sins that we were working through and confessing uh, to extreme degrees and talking about everything under the sun everything. And, everything. and knit our hearts together. Yeah. And so, like any, if I don't see you for like three to six months and we get back together, it's just like old times again. Like we're just, I know, we just pick up where we left off and we, and we can trust each other. No, for sure. I think that's one of the things that I've always cherished. And Rej always points out if you hang out with the Desert Brothers, you come back different. Mm. And I think there's something about the relationship that was formed in Mexico that, I don't, I don't think anything could replace that. That, that is a special moment and a time that we all shared. Yeah. And this is something that we get to cherish, I think. And it's, even though we have many other good friends right. that we have along totally. in our lives, this is just a unique situation of brothers that came from all different woods, man. It's yeah. just from Virginia to Atlanta to New York, you know, and Canada, Canada. <laughs> so it's like Canada, I know. So we can't forget Christian, man. So, yeah. I mean, all of us yeah. came together. Together and it's something about what God has done in our lives and really shaped us. And mm-hmm. I think I really question if that could ever be replicated. I don't know if we can because we talked about like, hey, we need to create this space. I wonder if that can be done again. Right. It was such a unique moment in history for totally, us. For sure. That shaped the man that we are today. Yeah. And that we're becoming. So And I think it like maybe it's because we have it's 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 weird. Like you all come together for four months and you your hearts are deeply knit together as you go through the spiritual experience, a pastor and training program. You know, we're praying, you know, I don't know how many hours a day. You know, we're starting off with worship and communion early in the morning. Yeah, that was we're spending sweet. all day every day together. Yeah. Uh, for four months and we're just talking about the Lord and Mm. praying and we're serving the orphans there. We're doing chores, feeding the pigs, (laughs) hurting the pigs pigs around. Yeah. And, uh, you know, cooking dinner and, you know, cleaning the kitchen and uh, leading worship and learning how to do church and, you know, all kinds of different responsibilities. But we spent all that time together and then boom, we're dispersed Mm. back 
all over the United States, all over yeah. different parts of the States and Canada. Hmm. And now, I mean, I don't know. I was just thinking this as you were talking. Basically, what has happened is we have people who we are we were closely connected to who are not in our immediate circles yeah. that we can um, we can kind of tell them anything because it doesn't affect our immediate world or immediate yeah. circle. You know what I mean? Yeah. There is no uh, repercussions for over confession or saying too much or talking crazy or whatever it may be. I agree. Because it's just like, well, brother, you, let's pray. You know, exactly. like, let's seek the Lord, you know, like, yeah. and... Um, I don't know. It's been very important and it's been influential and it's been so necessary in my life. I still feel it today. It was like when you were driving <laughs> this morning, I was just so stoked to be able to have you on. No, not even. And even if you just recall this summer, I, you know, I had this whole health scare. I was in Korea uh, yes. visiting Korea, you know, my parents, ex you know, I, I think I was supposed to be there for two and a half weeks, mm. ended up being two and a half months. Wow. Right. And in Korea, they have this crazy health like checkup, like a medical checkup, mm -hmm. yearly checkup. Really great healthcare. They do. And I think it's really efficient how they run things. And so I went there and Rijay was like, dude, we got to get this health checkup. And I was like, nah, I don't want to get my internal checked up, you know, because I got to do that whole colonoscopy. I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel too comfortable yet unless I have to. <laughs> it just was something that I'm just not down for, right? Yeah. And so we go down and I, just to kind of jump into this story, I think just going to Korea, Rijay was like, hey, we have to do this. You're 40. You got to get your health checked up. And we looked up the hospital that my parents had booked and I was like, man, it doesn't have good reviews. <laughs> and so we ended up canceling. We're like, dude, we're not going to go here. Wow. It doesn't seem like there's good reviews here. And Rijay yeah. was so adamant. She's like, dude, you got to do it. I got to do it. You have to do it. Long story short, listen to your wives. You Praise know. God for no, Rijay. Seriously. Shout out to Rijay. Shout out to Rijay. Thank you, hon. Uh, I told her, don't regret your decision because <laughs> it saved my life. Wow. And so all that to say, she forced it. And we ended up going to another clinic, which was my dad's friends. Did the whole health checkup ultrasound caught this mass in my kidney dude it was like pretty it was kind of surreal because they were like hey you have this tumor in your kidney and it's a good size right. and most likely it's going to be like 80 90 percent cancerous wow and i was like okay <laughs> so I'm, like, well, I'm trying to process i think right, BJ, you're 40 you're young you're healthy yeah. you have a young family you're like what in the world just happened yeah, yeah. i know where in the world was i considering that going to korea but I mean, we can go into that story and we can stay in it, but just the fact that I was able to text you guys yes. out of all things. Yeah, yeah. And you guys were, you know, it was just, we're on a chat together yeah. and it is like a spam kind of chat sometimes, yeah. you know, we just throw <laughs> random stuff up there. Tim <laughs> Toller, you know, he's always throwing some old praise music. Yeah, like, Tim, shout out to Tim. <laughs> you know, he's always throwing his stuff in there. And But the fact that you guys like came on yeah. and just started covering us in prayer. Yes. And... Like Nolan showed up and just sent like just things, resources. Yes. yes. And hit, Nolan and I go, you know, Nolan and I have some history. Too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll but never just, forget. I know, right? Fun times. Bay of Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just say uh, some mini skirmishes took yeah. place in Mexico yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, amongst many of the brothers. Yeah. I love that though. I love that even in that time, yes. like Carlos didn't intervene. Right. Like, he just. Wow. Yeah. He's just like. Let the boys be boys. Wow. Like, figure it out, Let man. Figure it out. Yeah, figure wow. it out. <laughs> oh, we get so mad on the basketball court, remember? Oh we get so ticked off. We would like, <laughs> it, it, we like made rules. It was just like if any brother gets, starts getting angry or in the flesh, everybody will just put their hand out, start walking towards him and pray for him. I so know. Be like, <laughs> so they'd be getting so mad and all of a sudden the brothers would just come around and you start praying for you. You're like, oh, yeah. like you just don't want it. It was mainly Eddie that we're praying <laughs> Eddie! Oh, man. Eddie Townsend. Yeah, it was mainly Eddie, I believe, that we're praying for. Kicking, kicking basketballs to the moon. Josh and uh, Short shorts. It's like, man, this is not right. This is Josh not Cisco wearing dolphin shorts. <laughs> headbands. <laughs> oh, my Daisy Dukes gosh. and headbands in Mexico. I can't believe it, man. Oh, man, all the guys get thrown oh. under the bus. I love it. Yeah. Well, they'll throw us, us under the bus. I know. Though, so. um, I got to throw my shots first. So we... Um, we met Mexico. Yeah. We had never met before then. Never. But we both grew up in Southern California. Yeah. And um, do you remember the bus ride down? I do. Who'd you sit next to? I sat next to Bijan, dude. Did you really? I sat next to Bijan. Bijan Mertalui. Oh my gosh, I sat next to Bijan. Yeah, yeah. 
people don't know who Bijan is. Yeah. You want to give a uh, who is Bijan? Well, Bijan is a very intellectual. I, to me, when I first met him, he was a soccer lover. He he talked, really yeah that guy. I talked, didn't know that. Yeah, he loved. He, I think he liked a lot of soccer. So I remember talking to him about soccer, and I was like, man, do I belong? Am I at the right place? <laughs> In my mind, I was like, what is this? No, but he's a cool guy. You know, he he went to what he was serving here in socal for a little bit and he went to new york mm -hmm. at redeemers and he, he served with tim keller for a while that's right and then he ended up going to uh, reality, reality london in london yeah and took, he took, tim chaddock's position yeah and that's where he's at now right yes he's there right now but bijan mertalui is like the uh he's a perfectionist like he's oh. like he's like the cleanest guy of all 22 <laughs> guys He's like OCD, like at a very, very high level. Oh yeah. And so like, I remember he had, he brought Vans down to, he was wearing Vans. Yeah. You can tell a lot about a guy by, by the shoes that he wears and he's wearing Vans. They were the blue, they were blue top. Yep. That's right. With I white bottom yeah. and he would clean them all clean the time. All the time. You, make sure you, you can't have clean Vans. But it was all dirt. Exactly. <laughs> all of Even Mexico. Even if you try to keep Vans clean, it will never stay clean, but he kept it clean. It was dirt everywhere. One of the worst things that we did to Bijan was Steven. <laughs> Taking off his clothes <laughs> and jumping into, <laughs> jumping into his perfectly made bed perfectly. on the top bunk. Perfectly and he made. took the top bunk intentionally, you remember? <laughs> he didn't want anybody touching uh, it. And we took a, we took a photo of, of, of Steven in that. Yeah. Just, and just to mess with Bijan. Yeah, it, and was it was like Bijan. a Kodak film thing. Yeah. So when he got home, he, he, got had, to, home. he had to develop the camera and see that Bijan was in. That's it. I'm right. sorry that Stephen was in his bed. But oh my gosh! You gotta you gotta picture this though, because his bed, like everybody just brought like sleeping, sleeping bags, bags and like a, yeah, like just like whatever, like rugged, you know. But Bijan has like a perfect sheet. White. He has a white quilt, <laughs> like know. like a duvet, like a duvet, like a big puffy, like. <laughs> it's. <laughs> Bijan, we love you. Shout out to Bijan. Yes, Bijan. We hope this reaches London. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's who I sat next to. But he also is a Bible scholar. Yeah, that's how he practices and studies the word. In exactly. His perfection, I think. Perfection. Like John, when he was teaching us, would even like say, Bijan, what did I say a couple days ago? And Bijan would be like, this verse, this <laughs> thing, this is where your points. Like he had it all written down and organized. Right. Oh, it was man. amazing. Bijan, yeah. That's so you sat next to Bijan on the way down. Yep, and that was that was kind of my experience. And then I remember we went to the taco joint. That was like the first thing. Yes. And I was like, man. No, first of all, when we met at the airport, I was like, dude, I'm the only Asian guy <laughs> in this whole group. <laughs> I was like, wait. <laughs> it, just, it felt it, it got real real quick for me. Uh, I was the only Asian guy yeah, in the whole group. We had we had. Yeah, we basically Dennis is Korean. Yeah, that was it, and I was the only. Martin guy. is uh, like Puerto Cuban, Rican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, well, Puerto Rican, and um, yeah, we weren't very uh, diverse <laughs> eth ethnically, ethnicity. Yeah, uh, our cultures, uh, but we we did come from different parts. Yeah, for of sure. the state. So yeah, yep. Martin was New York. Yeah. So I mean, all that to say, I think just that kind of set the tone, and I met Bijan. Hmm. And then it made me feel at home going to the taco stand. Mm. I forget what we used to call that place. Mm. There was a name that we... That taco spot? Yeah, I forget what it was. We go there and get the Coke. Yep. And then that was... Street tacos. Like, okay, this was really good. And I think that was a comforting spot for me. It was bomb. Yeah, it was bomb. And so I think just going into it, it was kind of like iffy at the beginning. But you know what? I signed up for it. I had this whole ordeal where... I just knew like I was going to be part of this group. I don't know if you had that sensation about this group, you know, that when you signed up, um, I didn't know how many people signed up. I didn't know how, how popular John was per se. I, I found it online. Out How'd of you all find it? Online. What do you mean? Like, I went on John Corson's website just to kind of look through his profile. How did you know about him? Well, I heard about John through K-Wave. Really? Yeah, I didn't know who John was prior to K-Wave. And he was on like at 8 o'clock every morning or yeah. 7.30, yeah. whichever. And I just, I remember listening to him on my ways to work. And I was like, I wonder who this guy is. And I looked it up and there was this little section, little tab. Like, hey, we're looking for men for pastors in training school. What? Yeah. 
And it was like right before the deadline. And I was like, you know what? This sounds pretty interesting. I'm in a season of my life where I started Bible college. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm studying. I'm in the ministry just little by little. And this is crazy. Yeah. So I, I clicked the link. And they're like, you got to turn your applications in right away. And, and, you know, the first thing I did is I went and talked to my parents about it. I don't know why. And then I was like, hey, what do you think about me going away for four months? And maybe it was because I had to empty the house. Mm. And my parents were like, I don't think that's a good idea, man. Like, you need to just finish your semester and finish your college. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. You know, I didn't think much of it. And But it's it's what's cool about it. My mom came back a week after and she was like, you know what, Dennis, dad and I talked about it. And they're in Korea, by the way. Mm -hmm. And they were like, hey, I think if you're pursuing ministry and you're in the work for um, the kingdom, mm. like maybe this is something that you need to do. Wow. And just with that, I just signed up. You put I, in the application. I put in the application. But I didn't know how popular, or I found out later when John shared like, and hearing it from the brothers, like he shared it to the whole Calvary Chapel Bible College. Oh, yeah. And I heard he's, it was pretty popular. There was no, a, Dennis, it was massive. <laughs> See, that's what I did not like, have any idea of. Like massive. Like, let me explain. Like, so John, first off, history of John Corson, if you don't know, mm -hmm. he's in Southern California. He's doing some work at Calvary. He's around Chuck Smith and all of these guys. He's doing ministry up at the camps. Uh, they kind of did some church work, I think, down in San Diego. Uh, I, I may be getting some of that wrong. But anyways, he gets he gets invited to go up to Oregon mm -hmm. by a family to start a Bible study up there. Oh, yeah. He starts the Bible study. The church grows to like 7,000 people. I know. It's crazy. A mega church up in the in South Oregon. Medford, right? Medford. Um, Applegate. That's crazy. Applegate, yeah. And um, he he... And then he comes back down to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa to help Pastor Chuck. Yeah. And, and everyone that was there in Calvary Chapel, and they were trying to help with transition and what was, you know, happened with Chuck. And anyways, John Corson starts a Bible study on Tuesday nights. Mm. And like three or 4,000 people start showing up to the study on Tuesday night. You serious? I used to go to it, dude. I'd be oh sitting there in the crowd gosh. like, this dude is, what is going on here? He's teaching through a book of Revelation. Wow. And uh, he taught through it. And again, the crowd just kept growing and kept growing. This was on Tuesday night. It was insane. At the end of the book of Revelation, uh -huh. when he finishes one of the final studies on that night, he says, I think it's time for me to go. I've been here for a long time in Orange County, and it's time for me to go to Mexico. Oh and I'm going to take 20 guys into Mexico no <laughs> for a pastor and training program. And I'm like sitting there and so many people are like, dude, you love John Corsi? He, he's going to Mexico. He's going to train a bunch of guys. And I'm just sitting there like, I can't believe this is happening, you know? And so thousands of applications came in from all over the United States. Wow. Uh, Calvary chapels all over the United States. And I don't, I don't know worldwide. I don't know. But yeah. anyways, this, this offer went out to, it went out on that Tuesday night and then it started traveling through Calvary chapel. And then it just reached out to all places and so I'm sitting there and when I'm filling out the application, dude, I'm like shaking, you know, just like, oh God, if you would be gracious. Oh man. Oh, if you would be gracious. So I would love to be what I want the golden ticket, Willy Wonka, oh, you know, dude. like I like, like, could I be one of the 20 chosen, you know? <laughs> and uh and then dude, I got the email. That's you remember the email? I remember the email. Yeah. That's why it's so weird when hearing. When I this. say the email, I feel something that I felt when I received the email. Yeah. It's so weird. See, it's completely different. I felt the same thing. I, I knew that this was something very unique and special, but I didn't have that backstory. And it was only until when John revealed that he prayed for every applicant. Every he application. Had every application laid out, prayed over it. And I don't know if we put a cover like page of our faces. It, I don't know if that was one of them or something. But You had to send in a picture. We did send in a picture. Yeah, we and, did. And then... He said he prayed over every single one, and yeah. he, this was the one. And yeah. to be very fair, I mean, Ben was already chosen. I feel like Cis <laughs> Cisco and Steven, Shout they're out ben, to ben. If you're listening, you know, we know, you know he, he ben, is the son. Yeah, he's the son. So Ben, Cisco, and Cisco was already chosen. They, yeah. were, they were the inner circle. They were the inner circle Peter, friends. Peter, James, and John. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was like, what, 17 spots yeah. left? Yeah. And out of that, I was like, wait, I'm here. And it was, it was kind of a surreal, it was a moment where I just felt like, okay, there was something divine beyond mm -hmm. 
just me thinking like, okay, this is going to be some training or mm-hmm. some kind of a teaching. Yeah. And I knew it was something very special from the beginning. Yeah. And it, well, it's classic because, you know, I sat next to, we're in the back of the bus, yeah. Reynolds. Oh, no way. I'm sitting next to Reynolds. <laughs> I'm like, so, you know, how'd you, you know, get into the school? You know, like, how'd you, how'd you get to Mexico? We're driving down. He's like, yeah, you know, this John Corson guy, I don't even know who he is. You know, I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, my youth pastor told me to like apply for this thing. And so I just did it and I oh, got in and I'm just like, gosh. what? Like, dude, you don't even know like what you're about to experience. Crazy. I mean, I, ex- I had experienced those teachings for like three years already. Like I was just digesting and I used to take notes. I used to listen to sometimes two, three sermons a day. I have these, the yellow notepads. I would just be writing down all these notes from John and then I got wow. his commentaries and I was like, so I was like full disciple. I mean, obviously I was a disciple of Pastor Greg, mm-hmm. but then I was starting to get to know the other Calvary Chapel pastors. And yeah. so... I thought it was a trip that outside of Bible college, there was this experience to go down to Mexico. And so, uh, yeah, that's how I got down there. But Reynolds didn't know. Dennis didn't know. I don't think um, Tim knew either. Really? I think Tim was working at Kinko's or something. Really? (laughs) Coffee store. What? Yeah, I don't. Tim, you can correct if if I'm wrong. But you got to come on the podcast. Yeah, he he was working at some store and some lady mentioned it or something like that. And that's how he found out. He was from West Virginia, dude. Right. West Virginia. West Virginia. You know, I don't know what happens in West Virginia. Yeah. It's like, (laughs) it's like, yeah. 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 but Country home, ta- yeah, take me home yeah. to the place that I belong. <laughs> West Virginia, know, right? mama. So I think it's like in light of all that, like how it's like the brothers came together. Like it's such a unique and a divine appointment. Like yes. I still remember the first night, that first night he gave the teaching. Mm-hmm. And he just called all of us to really kind of reorient and think about what we're about, like what we're living for mm. and what we need to turn from. He shared on Exodus 8. I, I, I think I will never forget that teaching because that was the first. And I think that really set the tone for the whole four months mm-hmm. that we're going to be there. That mm-hmm. is not just like, hey, you're just going to hear some sermons. Mm-hmm. Hope you get, take good notes. Mm-hmm. No, he was like, look, you're, you're here to be trained up mm-hmm. and you need to turn and you need to get your life right. And we repented that night. Yes. You remember that? He brought up Pharaoh and the frogs. Yeah. He says, don't push it off, man. He says to Pharaoh, Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, when do you want the frogs gone? And Pharaoh says, tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> and John's like, tomorrow? Mm. Why would you want the frogs gone tomorrow? Don't yeah. you want them gone now? Yeah. He's and like, uh, well, never came, man. Yeah. And he, he then John basically said, and a lot of you guys are saying, when do you want the sin gone? And you're like, mm-hmm. tomorrow. And he's like, tomorrow, why don't you want it gone now? You know, tonight, right now. Yeah. And uh, so one by one, he's, he, well, he basically called out the brothers and said, why don't you just stand up and confess your sin? That's right. And as deep as you confess is as deep as you'll be healed. Oh my gosh. I forgot about that. And he, he just asked us just to stand up and start confessing That's in right. front of all the brothers. I'm like, I'm not confessing <laughs> anything to these dudes. <laughs> I don't know these guys. I'm not saying anything. And I was just like, I'm not saying anything. Did I just like put my head down? I was just like sitting there. You know who the first one to stand up? Who was it? Chris Brown. Mm. Chris Brown. And he stands up and he starts confessing. Not the rapper Chris Brown. (laughs) He's not the rapper. He's not the rapper. Not even close to the rapper. (laughs) He's the officer ever. Anyways, we love Chris. Uh, Chris stands up and he starts confessing. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Ow, my ears. Like, what is he doing? You know, he's like, just saying like gnarly stuff. And I'm like, and then I remember John gave him a word. Mm. And then he said, um, whoever was standing on both sides of me says, stand up, cover him. Yeah. Pray for him. Yeah. Speak a word over him. Yeah. And so we, we started standing up on both sides of the guy who would confess and we would pray for him. And then, uh, this guy's like set free. And so one by one, it started happening. Yeah. And all these dudes confessed that night. That's so crazy. And I did too. Yeah. No, for for real. I think that was probably one of the most divine. Again, it's one of these appointed rhema moments that John gave. Like it was where the spirit moved so powerfully. And I think that really, again, like set the tone and the foundation for our brotherhood. Were Aaron and hers established that night? Was it like the ones on your right and your left or your Aaron? No, no, no. Aaron and her came sometime a little after that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that was a whole nother 
experience as well, dude. Yeah. We're like, who's the Aaron? Who's <laughs> yeah? I'm Moses. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be my Aaron? <laughs> Everyone wants to be Moses in that. <laughs> everyone in that camp is a Moses. Like, right. I'm Moses. You want to be my <laughs> right. dude? So many oh strong personalities. God. Dude, there are so many strong personalities over there. Like you can't even imagine. Like oh yeah, these dudes are all strong personalities for sure. I mean, forces to be reckoned with, and we're all thrown <laughs> thrown into this camp together, and it's just like let's grow in Jesus. Let's figure this out. Yeah, that was a that was a sweet time. Man. I'm gonna pull up a picture of all of us here. Oh, yeah. So here's the crew. Um, and here we are. Um, this is a different photo than the other. Um, there was another photo that we took that I've hanging in my office, but this is a special one. I don't even know where I got it from. But um, this is the one that Tammy gave to all of us, I think, at the end. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that I'm, I'm sh clean shaved, you know, so I haven't even grown a beard yet. And, and one of the other photos of our group where uh, my beard is like fully grown out. So I think this is like in the beginning. This like, is in the beginning. Yeah. Yep. And there's a crew. Look at Bobby over here on the right, right behind you, Dennis. Yeah, there it is, Bobby. And um, there's all the crew. And what's wild is that, again, a lot of strong personalities, but a lot of guys uh, stepped into ministry. A lot of guys stepped into pastoring. A lot of guys stepped into leading all kinds of stuff. And there's just a massive story sitting behind every single one of those brothers. Oh, yeah. And, um, but yeah, we, we grew together and there, there's the classroom right behind us. Uh, that thing right there yeah. is where we learned where we, uh, we spent hundreds of hours. Seriously. I mean, the, if you look at the schedule, man, it was morning worship every morning. We had communion and then we had what breakfast oh no we had a study we had a morning meeting before breakfast sometimes yeah we would do um i felt like we got up morning worship communion that was like 5 30 6 a.m and then but i also felt like we went on walks like early we in the did. morning yeah he kind of encouraged that and he was like go on walks and that's kind of like a new thing that i think john kind of set the rhythm for all of us is like go out and hear the Lord, speak to him, talk to him. We used to walk in those fields back there in the all back, there. all those fields. All, there's a whole like property line that we walk with the neighbor's fence and all that. It was so quiet. It was so quiet. Yeah. There's no, no cars really around. There's no TV there. There's no telephone there. I think the only access we had was like at the little market or yeah. something. You go make phone calls down <laughs> Punch. there. Poncho's market. Poncho's market. Yeah. Poncho's or something. I and think. Um, 25 cent Cokes. 25 cent Cokes. Yeah. Bottle Cokes. We were out there in the middle of nowhere trying to seek God, trying to grow together, trying to grow in his word and with no distraction, uh, no distraction. No, it was crazy. So we, um, yeah, I mean, any memorable teachings or, uh, things that like stick out to you? Like, you know, what, what were your like biggest takeaways? Mm. Because we went down there as a pastor and training program. Yeah. What do you think John was ultimately trying to like impart to us? Like when you reflect back on it. I mean, we're 20 years out. Yeah. I think he for sure wanted to impart to us the relationship with God. Mm. Like that was the element that it wasn't just centered on Bible knowledge. Mm. Like he was big on Bible knowledge. I mean, don't, <laughs> he taught the scriptures, right? right? But he introduced the Holy Spirit to us mm. like in such a powerful way like it was a practical way actually i think mm -hmm. how he approached it it wasn't like hey just read the word and get stuff out of it he's like go out there and spend the whole day in the mountains and don't come back until you hear something like and we went out to the mountains to shark spin and we sat in the in the mountains came back at night right you remember that yes and it wasn't like go study the bible right take your journal right Stand and watch. Habakkuk journal. Habakkuk, yeah. Just just wait on the Lord. And I think that element and and even, you know, I've been to different types of churches and sure. I understand. I think a lot of times we can center it just on scripture and which is very high and important. Of course. But sometimes we fail to listen to the Spirit's call. Yes. Like the Holy Spirit that's whispering, that's leading us to that truth and mm. the convictions that he is instilling in us. I think John taught us how to listen mm. and not only how to listen, he, at the end, he commissioned to live by faith and mm. step into that mm -hmm. chimney up the shaft. And I think that was one element that right. John was so big on like, Hey, it's okay to fail. It doesn't matter. It's first one 
to the city. Wow. That's it. Dennis, please right? unpackage this. <laughs> unpackage that teaching. For right? Me, I mean, I, you remember when he taught on that? What was, what was that guy, Joab? Was, yeah, he told he told him to go in the city and shimmy up the ch- the yeah, shaft. Whoever opens a gate, yeah. you're going to be rewarded. David mm-hmm. said, mm-hmm. and his one of his generals, Joab. He's I think it's Joab. Mm. He's the guy who shimmied up the shaft. Out right. of all things, you look at a shaft, you, it's a literally like a a hole, mm-hmm. right? Of a like a plumb line or whatever it is where all the water drip. And he climbed it up and he opened the gates and he got rewarded. And, and that, think, that let the, the soldiers in basically to take exactly. over. And I, I remember John teaching on that and he's like, look, you guys are the ones that's going to be sent. Mm-hmm. And whoever goes first, you're going to take that city. Wow. And he, he, I think that's a prophetic word. It's wow. kind of a rhema. I wouldn't sure. say like, don't look at the scripture. This is how everyone needs to do it. But sure. I think he laid some foundation and a principle for us. Like, look. The first one gets the, you know, the early bird, uh, early bird gets the worm type of mm-hmm. thing. But he brought it to us in a way where we're young minds, naive, kind of like innocent. We're, we're, we don't, we're blinded by all the stuff that could happen in the world. Right. And we just took it and believed it and went. Right. I remember looking at Tyler right there holding the Bible next to Bijan. Wow. Where did he go? Montana? Yeah. He went to Montana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that guy went to Mont to took start the, a church. Right. Took the yeah, took the risk, went after it. He got married at like what, twenty? Yeah. He was like one of the younger guys and yep. he got married and took off. Right. And did good. Yes. You know, and I think just kinda just seeing that that pattern, you know, and I I I, I think that was one of John's hearts. And I think that was what John did. He went from California to Oregon. Mm. He packed his family, drove up there, and the family was like, hey, we want some a pastor here. Yeah. Do you remember he, he said the first baptism that he did? Like, Yes. The people yeah, he <laughs> lined said, up. Yeah, yeah. He said they're all a bunch of naked hippies. Naked or yeah. hippies. Yeah, naked hippies <laughs> who are like growing weed out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And he was just like, well, I, I, I guess, I guess I got- they, nobody told him to, you know, <laughs> Probably we got church T-shirts for you, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he didn't. He didn't tell him put the T-shirt. Right, on. right. He just baptized them. Right. But I was like, what? right. That, that is crazy. Radical. That is pretty crazy. Yeah. No, it's a it's such a good word, Dennis, because you know I think John, and again, we don't want to misspeak for John, but we're just trying to understand, you know, ultimately what was what he was trying to minister to us, and ultimately our takeaways from it, but. Uh, obviously, shout out John Corson if you're listening. Come on the show. We want, <laughs> John, we want to hear. But yeah, I think that, you know, John, and maybe as most pastors get to, they start to realize that their congregation knows the word of God, mm-hmm. but does not live the word of exactly. God. And he's he's like, I know you guys know this. And if somebody brought this up. We were just talking about it, that so often we're constantly trying to tell the church, what to do, mm. but we don't show them how to do it. Yeah, We don't disciple and show them how. Yeah, And John was trying to show us how. He kept trying to give us the how. Yeah, And I even remember the, something used to go around was the, uh, the, a, a similar unholy trinity where we uh, use it, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy, Holy Bible. Holy scriptures, yeah. And what happens Bobby is, say he, don't quote me on that. Yeah, don't quote, don't quote him on that. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. I don't think it was John. It came somewhere. But yeah. we, um, what happens is, even the professor can know the scriptures, yeah. but not have the spirit of God in them. Sure. And we 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 walk on this line, even in the church. Sometimes the 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 head is so full of knowledge. Oh yeah, and we can just destroy people with the word of God. Yeah. But oftentimes we don't live out the teachings and the truths that we know to be true. And I think John was trying to inspire and encourage and show us pictures through principle of Old Testament and New Testament. You must live these things out. You must get after it. Like exactly. take steps of faith, trust the word of God, live these things out. Yeah, no, I agree. I think just looking at my life too, it's like, Dude, I went through this whole cancer thing, going back to that story, mm. just kind of going into my life, like having to now know that I survived cancer mm. by the prevention and the grace of God, mm. like solely on the grace of God, because mm-hmm. we found this thing before it grew and it spread to the bodies. Mm. And so it was contained. We got it out. It was like right before stage two. So the surgery was successful, but the doctors were like, dude, if you probably missed this, so maybe next year. 
it, it could have been a complete different story. Mm. And I think in light of that, in hindsight, I'm like, we got to live our lives, man. Mm. Like, like there's some things that we so, I don't know what it is, but we try to hold on to it and preserve this mm -hmm. thing. And, and, you know, it's good things like family and security and, and mm -hmm. children. And these are great things that we enjoy, but we forget like, dude, just, you can't hold it right. on your own. Right. These are things that God allows us to enjoy. And I think I kind of had this realization again, just kind of renewing in my heart and my mind is like, just don't be afraid to live, like mm. live it out. Like mm -hmm. your life is not, you don't know when you're going to go. Mm. And, you know, I, I think that's one of the teachings that I, I, takeaway from even John, like he lived it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of cool to hear like your story of John, like mm -hmm. ending the study of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Dude, he had a lot of things going for him in yeah. SoCal. Yeah. And he's like, I'm leaving. I'm going to Mexico with these 20 kids. 20 <laughs> kids, literally kids. They're, it's kids. just so crazy, man. Have you seen 20 year olds recently? Yeah, I know. They're crazy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you go live, go, go, you, you know, you pat, you're 50 years old or whatever, you're 55. Yeah. You go pack up your bags and go Seriously. with a bunch of random kids. I don't know if that I, you do don't that. even know. <laughs> exactly. You don't even know if you they're going to be, dude, that's crazy faith if you think about it. Yeah. You know, it's crazy faith. Crazy. But that's the thing is, John. you know, John saw Jesus, you know, take time with disciples and pour his life into them. Mm. And he saw the priesthood too. Yeah, I remember him yeah. pointing that out. It's Just like a- The priests, yeah. The that, that they, they started the priesthood at, at 30 years old. They would start their ministry just like Jesus did at 30 years old. Yep. But at 50 years old, when they got to 50, the Levitical priesthood would turn around and start training up the next up and coming yeah, priests at 50. Yeah. And John was like, again, I'm not just going to memorize the scriptures. I'm going to just start doing, I'm going to try to do this. And I don't even know if it's going to work. I'll just do it and see what happens. Yeah. I don't remember who said it. I was Chan or I can't remember who said it, but it was like, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them and they father, son, and the Holy spirit, teach them to deserve all they commanded you. Uh, what do we do? We memorize that verse. <laughs> it's like, no, I said, go and make disciples of all nations. Like, but that's classic, right? Go pray, go seek me in the private place, in the secret place. Go find me, seek me and you will find me. Go do these things. What do we do? Memorize that verse. That's so funny. It's like, and we must memorize the verse for that washes the mind and the heart, but we must get on obeying these things. And I think that's exactly, you said it earlier, but I think that John was trying to teach us had to really know God and to build a real relationship with him because yep. he knew if we had that, yeah, he knew if he could gift us with a real relationship with God, yeah, like the prophets of old had, like the apostles had, like these, like these, like if he could just give us a glimpse of that, then we could go on the rest of our life just knowing the Lord. Yeah, but think about it. It, it did change our lives. It did. That, that's the crazy part. He, he took a step of faith and obe obeyed his convictions and it altered our lives forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't say anymore, any any time that Rijay and I meet new people or even talk about our lives, mm -hmm. it always goes back to Mexico. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Because Rijay was actually part of that process. Right. We started dating three months in. Wow. And then in three months of dating. Are you serious? Yeah. I went away for four months. Oh my god. And gosh. so she was part of that process. Everything I was learning I was writing the letters to to. You would write letters to her. We had should, no email. Yeah, we, we had, had no, no email. We had no phones. We had no phones, no internet. Nothing. Dude, our mails would take a week, like each way. And yeah. I remember we have a box of letters that we still have not opened, but I'm hoping that one day our kids could open it. And even for us, like just, so cool because we. I I remember you just writing all the things that John was teaching us. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, Rijay, this is what it is. This is grace, mm -hmm. you know, unmerited, undeserved favor, man. You need to receive God's grace, the, yeah. the grace bomb. Remember we're yes. talking about the atom bomb and yes. the grace bomb? Yes. I remember writing all that down for her. And I, I, I think just that's always been a point of reference for us. Like mm. it forever altered who I am to, to become the person I am and continue to becoming mm -hmm. the man that I am today, you know? And I think... It's something that I cannot just kind of brush off. Dude. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And I, I think that's one thing that, you know, as you mentioned, like we all know the principle. Oh, we got to live it out. We got to act it out. But again, I think, I believe in this point of my life, 
you cannot live truly um, the life of wor- a spirit-filled worshiper, like living in faith without the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I think that's the element that's beyond just knowledge of the scriptures. Mm. You need the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. to actually make something of God. Like, to be my witnesses. Yeah, it is. It's, it's not just, it. I, I can't try to muster something up on my own. That's something that I realize now too. Yeah. Like in my age, I'm like, I can try to go and do stuff like that sounds cool or that is something that is really like good, but without the Holy Spirit, I just know it's not going to last. And so that's kind of another season that I'm really seeing is that I really would love for people not only to study and know the scriptures, but yes. listen to the Lord Yes, because he is leading you yes. and you are uniquely created by him and for him and for his glory. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I think we kind of shy away and we kind of tend to be afraid yeah. of fully blossoming into the person that God yeah. intended you yeah. to be, right? And in order to get there, you need to commune with the Holy Spirit through yes. the scriptures, through your time of meditation and receiving. Yes. A lot of times my prayer has shifted from mm. saying all these things. And now my prayer time is just waiting, mm. just learning to stay quiet mm. and listen. Yes. Because <laughs> I can talk. Be still yeah. and know that I am God. Right. I will be exalted among the nations. Mm. Yeah. You know, I... Uh, yeah, it's, um, you said communing with God, you know, getting alone with him, you know, spending time with him. And yes, the, the scriptures come to life, you know, once we, once we seek him, once we know him, once we find him. And you said the Holy Spirit of God is leading you. Mm. And I love the way you, you said that because I think that we like to sit in the realm of law. Yeah. We like to fall back on the law. We love the practical and we love the immediate answer of the scripture, which is, of course, the right answer. Yeah, always. 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 But but the application of that scripture in your life today, right now, is the spirit of God speaking directly to you. It's showing you. And you can't find that until you seek him. You can't find that. And I think that that real-time application, mm. it only comes in real prayer, real time of communion with God. Yeah. And again, we, we spend so much time talking about it. Yeah, seriously. But, but not anywhere near as much time do we actually spend doing it. Exactly. And in Mexico, we were forced into a situation in which we spent more time doing it than we did talking about it. Seriously. And I mean, it was... John be like, we're going to pray for an hour right now. We're just like, okay, here we go. You know, it's like everybody on your knees. Okay, we're getting on our knees. Know. You know, so, and we're just staring at the floor and it's just like, okay, everybody just start, let's just start talking to the Lord. And then yeah. in the middle of it, he would even, I remember he stood up in the middle of the, some of those corporate prayer meetings because guys would just start praying and rambling. And then he's like, hey guys, if the spirit of God is not moving you to, to say something or pray something specific don't just do, just don't just pray void, you know, random vain stuff. Like yeah. let's wait. Silence is okay. You know, like let's just wait on the Lord. Let's, yeah. let's pray. Let, let's pray um, specific prayers that are really on our heart, that God's really working in us. I thought it was so powerful. That is. Do you remember when, do you remember when Reynolds stood up in the middle of uh, the class uh-huh. and he's like, you know, John, like. I don't, I don't think I see this like baptism of the Holy spirit, like in the scripture, but I don't think I have that. Like, I don't know what this is. Like I, I need the Holy spirit. Like yeah. I need the Holy spirit of oh, God man, to like show up Reynolds, man. and Reynolds, he stood up in the middle of the class and John's like, all right, Reynolds, you know, get up here. And he like, John like lays hands on him. He's like, brothers, let's pray for Reynolds. You know, God, we pray that your spirit would fill them and do the insane dude because yeah. of the one guy yeah. who like leaves Mexico <laughs> <laughs> and immediately starts baptizing people when he got home. Yeah. Like immediately, like he gets home and he's like, that's it. We're going to the lake. You know, like all of his college kids, all his college friends, like we're going to the lake. We're going to baptize. You know, he starts baptizing people. Reynolds, man. It was like that first week or the second week. I thought he had wrote a letter. Or he told us later, like he baptized like 30 or 40 yeah. people. <laughs> Then the house Bible study start, the house fire Bible house study fire. start, house fire. That's fires. how house fires, fires began. A lot you of just start, don't realize. He yeah. starts all these little Bible studies in these different in houses. Clemson, yeah. In, in universities. 
and then and then a house fires band starts and like all that worship all that music came out and all they literally started the movement of like that like you know band in the center and like all the you know everybody around and like everybody chanting and clapping and like celebrating and like that's insane to think that it's become what it is you know and it's like i i just couldn't believe it he was like hey we're starting this thing take a look listen i was like whoa this is like good stuff you know reynolds sent us good good father like yeah back in like what was it 2007 or so early it was like way back way back i think that's when itunes was like beginning like it was in the earlier stages he's like you guys gotta listen to this This it's such a good song this is awesome stuff we're like yeah thanks reynolds this is great dude i know but like who would have known that like i mean pat barrett and chris tomlin and like all i mean it's so weird to trace all this back because i'll never forget like I loved Reynolds' honesty because he was always ready to, because he didn't grow up in our tribes or in our circles. He was always ready to like kind of test the things. Yeah, and explore. Yeah, exactly. And wasn't it beautiful that Mexico was a place, a safe place to do that? Yeah, it was completely. And I think it was controlled too. There wasn't like much we can do, (laughs) but it was enough in that area where we can just explore and share and just be together and and not be judged. And Mm -hmm. that was one thing that I feel like Mexico, God allowed us to have. Yeah, dude. I mean. That's the word, Dennis. It's a place where we weren't judged. Yeah. We're, ju- we're judged a lot today. Isn't that interesting that I, I, I actually believe that's something that Rije and I feel so com- um, strongly convicted to always provide for this world is a space, space of peace. Like I want to, I believe for me and, and for the most of church that we are the, the people of Shalom mm-hmm. and we are the connectors, the, the people that provide that space of peace. Mm-hmm. And I think so many people in the world who are hurting, who are lost, who are searching for things, they need that safe place. Mm -hmm. Because this place where we're in now, currently it's so like raw and Mm -hmm. it's just, it's too hostile. Mm. Not that it's anything new. There's nothing new under the sun. It's always been this. But when you look at the gospels and when you see the early church, it was always this safe places, safe havens for people to come. And I just, you know, whether it be from city of refugees to, you know, just where we are today, like, that's where I I think John did that for us. And I still have that value that I hold to open up our doors. And I think you did that too. Like yeah. when I see you, like you guys continue to open your doors. And it's something that we have to, to today um, based on what we experienced. And so, yeah, it was like we, well, the first, that first night of confession, I think like we realized like, Oh my gosh, I just said some like really gnarly stuff about my life that <laughs> everybody at home would probably condemn me for and like kick me out of the church. Yeah. But like John like kind of said some really kind things and like prayed for me and built me up and then these brothers next to me like didn't like shame me, like they actually prayed for me and encouraged me and it yeah. they became my friends yeah. after I confessed. So then I was like I just want to confess more. Yeah. Like I'm I'm open, like this is safe. Yeah. I think Jesus had a way of doing that. Who, who did he make not safe? Who did, who was he very direct with? The self-righteous. <laughs> Always the self-righteous, man. Uh, this is a self-righteous. He make them uncomfortable. He'd go after them. Mm-hmm. But those who were broken and those who were ready to confess, he created a safe place for them immediately. Yeah. And uh, he made sure that they, he, he is, he is the safe place Yeah. for, for in him, we can hide. He is our shelter, right? That's he right. is, um, Yes, uh, thou art Lord out of shield about me. You're my glory and the lifter of my head. Yeah. Like you are the place I can hide in and feel. I can talk to the Lord and say anything. Yeah. I can talk crazy. I can say anything to him. Yeah. You're not going to leave me nor forsake me. Yeah. Uh, you do that in some churches. You do that in some places. Um, you're not, it's not going to go well, right? Yeah. And that's kind of created a lot of this. A lot of the problems we have in the church today, you know, is that people, they can't be real. They can't be honest. They can't be open because they're scared they're going to lose. Um, yeah. They're going to lose the relationship with the people. They're going to sure. lose friendships. Um, so they can't be honest about whatever it is. That's what I love, Dennis. So it's like, because of that, it's allowed me to be honest with you about my marriage, yeah. about my, 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 my secret situations that like just are burdening me or I'm overwhelmed by. 
And I think that we need that in life. We do. You know, we, we need to have people in our lives that we know, I pretty much say whatever I want and I don't, I mean, he'll tell me I'm wrong Yeah. and he'll tell me you need to stop that. And he'll tell me you need to get counseling for that. You'll tell me you need to, you know, whatever. But at the same time, you say, I love you. I'm for you. Let's pray. Like our friendship isn't ending because of this. Like everything's okay. Like you're not, you're no different than anybody else on the planet. Wasn't that, right. that, wasn't that the beauty of the it thing? Is. That's exactly what it is. I think that's... Yeah. After we confess, we realize, oh my gosh, we're all the same. Yeah, we're... <laughs> <laughs> this is a pastor in training school and we're all a bunch of sinners. Uh-oh. Yeah, but then, but that's what we needed to come to realize, man. Like a lot of times we're going to try to cover our shame. And that's that's one thing that's going to keep us from sharing and mm. the lack of humility, the lack of the openness, right? And I, I was just actually thinking about that last night um, of Matthew 7 when, when all these people at the end times are going to come to Jesus and be like, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? And Jesus is like, I never knew you. Mm. And when you see the, the patterns of all these people that come up to Jesus is like, I did all this. It mm. was always work-based. Mm. It was always performance-based. Wow. And I was just reminded, it's, it's so simple, right? But I was reminded again, nothing I could ever do in this life could earn his love mm. to for me to earn that love and acceptance from him. Mm. It was given. Amen. And I need to embrace that. Yes. And but when I embrace it, man, good works come out. Mm. That's the response. It, it is a rightful response, a reaction where I, I detest what is not good, mm. what is evil, and I begin to love on his righteousness. Yes. I see it because there's so much life and beauty. Mm -hmm. And when I think that's something that I, I have been really just embracing in my life and it's just it brings me back to the core basics of the gospel mm. like dude you are loved mm -hmm. you are accepted and mm. you have been granted this life mm. because of the cross mm. he went there for you he rose again to give you that hope and assurance that you're not going to fade away mm. even after death nothing could separate you and i i i really would love for even people um audiences to my family to hear because again when I look at my kids, it's always work-based. <laughs> Daddy, right? Isaiah's doing this. Right. Like, you know, he needs to get punished. Oh, it's not fair. <laughs> Nora got that. You know, she. Why come she has that? I can't have that. Yeah. And you know, we we base it on all of our merits. Wow. But you know, it's different how that is given um, by God. It's mm -hmm. really granted to us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just I receive it with all gratitude. And man, I want to live that. I want to live that abundant life. That of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what John ultimately poured out to us. Yes. Because he was living it out. Right. He wasn't he wasn't like shying away. He I think he probably did probably get criticized for yeah. taking a bunch of twenty guys, not even a bunch, just a handful of guys. Totally. And leaving the opportunities that he had. Right. And but he did it faithfully. And it forever changed. And it's interesting that it didn't continue. He had made the attempt one more time with the older guys. Right. Because I think he realized right, he's 20 like, year olds. What have I done? Uh, do these guys. <laughs> he's like, what do I do, what do, I do with the 20 year olds? <laughs> and then he went to the 30 year olds. Yeah, yeah. And then it never continued on. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, he took a risk and he, I was looking, I was watching John closely, like when we were in Mexico, I was look w trying to find the chink in his armor mm. and, um, I was, I was shocked by how invested he was in Jesus. He's a Jesus guy, dude, <laughs> every was. day. I mean, he's up like 5 AM, like walking and praying. You just walk, if you wake up before the sunrise and you go out on that road, yeah. there's John. Yeah. Walking with his Bible, talking with the Lord, praying for us, you know, and then day after day, he would come in there and just keep serving us and keep mm. pouring grace on us and keep correcting us right. and keep encouraging us and keep, I mean, like you're, you're looking, you know, you, you, because again, there's the guy on the stage, but then there's this guy that was standing before us in there. And I, and I kept trying to figure out like, there's gotta be two different guys here, you know, yeah. like, but. I realize like it's the same guy, you know, like, what and you he's see is what you get, man. It's a real, it's great. I mean, it, it was, it was unreal. And obviously nobody is uh, perfect and everybody has sin and, you know, and everybody uh, needs Jesus the same. Um, but John was even, even in uh, mistakes and, or even in 
um, things he wished, you know, he didn't do correctly while we were out there or whatever. He was just honest with us about it. Like, guys, I probably shouldn't have said that, you know, and mm. maybe we should have done that differently. And yeah. maybe, I'll, you know, try this. You just, so true. he was honest about that stuff. And it really, um, it was fun to watch him up close, you know, such, you know, um, a powerful guy. And I want, I wanted to say that those brothers who are listening, who feel like they can't confess anymore because they feel like, uh, they're going to be shamed or they're going to be, um, no, you're not. Yeah. No, No, you're not. Yeah. Not with me and Dennis. Amen. There's a safe place. And, uh, if you need, um, you need to talk about whatever you want to vent, you know, you want to whatever, shoot the rap about whatever the door is open and there is no judgment. There's only what was exactly sitting there in Mexico. It is the encouragement and grace of God sitting there and ready. Because that's what he does for us. And so, Amen. and man, we need that safe place. The Amen. brothers need it. No, that's so good. I think, you know, I hope that whoever's listening, that yeah. they'll come to the barn. <laughs> come to the barn, dude. <laughs> and, and do come that. chat it up with me. No, seriously. I think they... People, All Mexico brothers are welcome at this seat right they here. have to do it, bro. Because this is something that, you know, we are not designed to hold it in. Yes. And somehow, some way, if we suppress it, it's going to come out other ways. That's what I realized in my life. And just kind of, kind of shifting the tone, possibly even to like marriage too, like, you can in marriage you can't hide anything i think it's the biggest accountability even as much as we can share our things like in marriage you just can't avoid things <laughs> it's like nope yep whatever is inside <laughs> it's gonna come out you know out. we can do the pulpit stuff so well like we can preach a great sermon right. have this perfect smile have the great light but we right. go home and if it's something's <laughs> unresolved and it always happens to be not nah, not all the time but you know whenever before we go up to speak and region i used to always fight and argue like, yeah why now? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know what it's, I mean? It's my flesh or the enemy. I don't exactly. know what it is. But it's not Rijay's fault in, by any means. It's just in marriage, I think a lot of these unresolved things, when you don't confess your sins and you don't, you don't have an outlet. And that's why I think so many people are into addictions and mm. they, they go into these deep holes of darkness mm. of whatever it may be, right? And... That's why all the more we need to be open and share and confess. Mm. And I don't think confess solves anything. Right. It doesn't solve the whole problem, sure. but it is the beginning. It's the start. It's the start. It's it, right. That self-awareness and being able to embrace God's gift yes. and his spirit over you to restore you. Because I do believe ultimately, again, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that mm. sanctifies us. Mm. He's the one who's constantly making us more like Christ mm. and he empowers us to do that. And I think that's, it really is an important piece because in marriage, you're not going to be able to hide it. Mm. And I, I, I want to commend young people, younger men to hurry up and get married, mm. like man up because yes. you're going to be held accountable yes. to another yeah. degree. Yeah. You need sanctification. <laughs> you need some sanctification. And you need it now. Yeah. <laughs> I know. The longer you delay, the worse it's going to be. Exactly. I, I, I realize like the older you are, it's harder for you to change. Oh and, man. And that's why it's harder, I think, just oh, yeah. in general, you know, to find uh yeah. But I remember Frank Sontag, he was on the show and he said, you know, I came to faith like, I don't know, his 50s, I think it was. He says in his 50s and he was... He, he was, was 50 when he came to Yeah, faith. yeah. And, he, right. you know, he was he was like kind of just saying like, man, it's a bummer because, you know, an older gentleman just said like, you know what, um, because you've come to faith later, like God's basically going to sanctify you fast. <laughs> and like, you're going to have to learn very, the hard, hard, hard way, you wow. know? Is spread out over, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of sanctification. You know, you come yeah. to Christ when you're 15 and you walk with him until you're 70 or 80, you know, mm-hmm. before you step into heaven, whatever. And you have all this time spread out to grow, but it's like if God wants to do something, you know, and you very quickly. That's crazy. And you got to think of the experience and wisdom that you have as a non-believer in your 50s and all the things you've done. Then the lights turn on and yeah. then you're like, oh my gosh, like, look at I can see everything, you know, yeah. like all of my, oh, wow. you know, sin. You know, you're foolish when you're young. You can't even see your sin. Exactly. Like, you can't. You, you can't see anything. Dude. The older you get, the more you see and the faster you need to grow. Yeah. Um, we not only grew spiritually in Mexico, but we had a ton of fun. We had so much fun, bro. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of fun and uh, making fun of each other, playful banter, goofing off, oh, uh, doing gosh. doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I want to pull up our, uh, we, we did some, uh, rock rolling now, didn't we? Dude, there was uh, no toys. Oh, here we nothing. go. We like, had nothing out there. I got to so. pull this one up. So, uh, this, this is, here's, uh, me, Dennis and Reynolds. 
Uh, did you take this one, Dennis? Is this you? Oh, yeah, I, it was, it's not me. Someone took it. Probably Steven. Or... Okay. Um, here we are on the top of what we call Mount Sinai. This is like a four <laughs> a four hour hike. Is that right? Yeah, four hour hike. And um, we left like five or four thirty in the morning that day. And that here morning. in the bottom of the valley here is is the mission all the way up there at the top of that uh, left corner. Yeah, that all that lush green. Um, that's where the mission is, or where we stayed with the orphans and uh, and learned together. Um, but here we are on the top taking a picture. And you were saying earlier, we, we went up with one bottle of water. One bottle. One stinking bottle of water thinking we're going to survive. I mean, it wasn't hot in the morning. So we we're like, dude, it's not going to get. <laughs> we shared it. We shared it. We shared it. And, you know, I think Billy had the backpack, water pack. <laughs> he was the only guy. So we all took sips out of that backpack. Yeah, the, yeah. The camel pack. The camel bag. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's a, I think Billy Beckman was the only one that had it. He was the only prepared guy. But we were so thirsty. Dude, we were so thirsty. And you remember we hiked up this mountain and the sun came up and it was stinking hot. <laughs> and then we had, by this time, we killed a rattlesnake. You guys had killed the rattlesnake. We killed the rattlesnake. Yeah. By this time, a rattlesnake was beheaded. <laughs> we came up. What happened was we're, yeah, we come up on this rattlesnake and like, I think Reynolds is like, we got to kill this thing, oh you know? My gosh. And I remember we were up on top of this rock and we were picking up giant boulders, trying to drop it on the head of the snake to try to crush it. We're just uh -huh. like, boom, biblical picture. <laughs> The heel will crush his head. They were trying to crush his head, dude, and we're throwing it down on there. Boom, boom. We finally kill it when somebody had a knife yeah. and we cut the head yeah. of it off. Yeah. And then someone uh, took the snake down. Billy? Yeah. Someone took the snake and we cooked it. Yeah, we cooked it. Yeah. And we, we skinned it. Yeah. Somebody exactly. had the skin. I think it was somebody. I remember somebody had that skin. It wasn't you? No, I don't know if I had the skin. I thought Billy, I, I don't remember who used the knife, but somebody skinned it and tried to keep the Maybe skin. it was Billy. But um, we rattlesnake, uh, we go up there with no uh, water. water. You said we found, yeah. but we get up to the we top. We get up to the top, which is, this is the, the top. And then there was this big ladder that was standing up in the middle. I think there, it used to be a cross and it, like the winds broke it. It fell down. Yeah. But right at the foot of the cross, there was like bunches, bun many bottles of water just left there. We don't know how long it's been there, but it was bottles of water. And we're like, bottles dude. Bottles of water for us at the top we of the hill. We had to just, we went in for it, man. We're like, all right, dude, we're thirsty. We're going <laughs> to drink it. We opened it up. I, I I had a choice to do it now. I probably wouldn't have drank it, you yeah. know, but we, we didn't get sick. Oh. We drank it, dude. We drank that water, refilled our bottles. But I still remember we refilled our one bottle <laughs> and then going back, we still ran out of water. Really? And it was so hot. It was so hot, and that's when we started drinking out of Billy's water bottles and a water the Camelback. So let's see if this is gonna play. So this, um, I'm pulling up this video here that Dennis sent me, and here we are. Uh, let's see if we can go full screen here. Fifteen years ago, okay. I think it's gonna play. Okay, here we go. This is it said fifteen years ago. Yeah, when I uploaded it. I mean, it's been longer. So we would do this. We would go up to the top of this mountain, Sinai. We would take crowbars with us. Crowbars. Like, like we crowbars. We took four. Yeah. We took four crowbars. Like real crowbars, like steel <laughs> crowbars. And we'd find the biggest rocks on the side of this mountain. And we would pry them oh open. My gosh. Pry them. And these giant boulders. I mean, we're talking the size of like a like a Volkswagen like yeah, beetle. A like bug, a, yeah. yeah, a bug. Like big, big, big. And we would tip these rocks over the side and they would start rolling. And then they would start rolling. Mm -hmm. Then they would start bouncing and they bouncing. would bounce like 15, first five 20, feet, yeah. 10 feet, no, it was 20 15, feet. Yeah, it was like, huge. They just take off into the air and we would just lose it. I mean, it's like, <laughs> this This is our this is our Disneyland in Mexico. We didn't have phones, we didn't have anything else to do. Oh yeah. I'm recording. Oh, dude. Oh, that is a big motor truck. <laughs> see, watch out, watch out, watch out. Oh, dude, it's dust, man. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh that just got oh. air right there. Oh, oh. <laughs> It's still going. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I got it. Oh, oh my gosh. Where is yeah, dude, that's <laughs> crazy. So, but to th make sure there's nobody, there's no pa walk paths in this no, hill. No, nothing. Yeah, <laughs> nothing. Nothing even close. Uh, yeah. That's That's like in some valley somewhere. Yeah. We're dumping that like into this valley, but 
We would rock roll uh, for fun on the weekends. That was the fun thing to do in the weekends. Dude, I cut my leg open on one of those rocks. <laughs> I, I had a, a cut this big, Are literally. Yeah, it's the scar is still there. A giant slice in the side of me. Because what I was doing is... Oh, my. I'm on the right side. All you guys are over here, and we're all prying together. And the side of it had like, it almost had like a knife edge on it, right? And as we pushed it, it took off, and my leg was sitting there. Oh, it just went, what? You know, just, it just nicked, Sli wow. yeah, just nicked the edge of my leg and just sliced it open. I started bleeding. I think we took the shirt off and just like wrapped it. I kind of, uh, in order to get, remember, yeah, yeah, in order to get down the hill. But um, it, it, it wasn't like painful, but it was bleeding a ton. Oh, my God. And uh, yeah, we still had to get down the hill. That was crazy, man. I know you don't have another photo, but we we got in trouble, remember, for thinking around. <laughs> we, I don't know the the mission staff, the girls did something to us. Yes, they they messed with us, and then while they were in the restroom, we like tied the restroom door to a tree. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think there's a picture of you and me. Yeah, like holding the, like holding that line down so they can't come out of the restroom. Let me see if I can find it. And John got so. Like that was probably the worst we've seen of John to correct us. That he, yeah, he was really mad for sure. He was mad. He was okay. mad. Okay. Let me see if I can find this. Cause I think I have that. Is it Dave Corson that went to John and told on us? Somebody did. <laughs> I don't know who did it, but okay. we, we got in big trouble. That's for sure. Oh my God. Um, it was you, me and Phil in that photo. It was the afternoon or in the morning before lunch. Yeah. And then John was walking down and he's like, what's going on? And somebody told on us. Yeah, somebody told on us, and then we went and um, we went inside, and, and he uh, did a whole teaching on that too. Yeah, we got really in trouble. And just going back to that, I think John, we didn't get a syllabus when we were in like Mexico for this pastors in training. Right. John, I think, literally received the words every night or that morning, every morning to share with us. Yeah, that was the crazy thing too. It was like, what? Yeah, what? There was a time where all of us woke up in the middle of the night. Like, it began with one, I think, one of the two brothers. They began, they were like, dude, we got to pray. Something is like uneasy with us. They woke all of us up. We went to the classroom. We began to pray. And there was just a lot of uneasiness in, in, in that room. And just We're just praying against this kind of like the spirit of uneasiness and just things that was kind of really shaking us up, like worry about home and families back at home. Right. You remember that morning John came in and he's like, dude, I've been up all night praying for you guys. Yeah. And we got up. We were like, what? We were up. Praying. We were up in the middle of the night. And he, th was it like the, the early, like bloody sunrise? It was super red that morning. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I, so yeah, we... Yeah, everybody was like bothered by something and we get up in the middle of the night. One of the brothers wakes up everybody at like one in the morning. <laughs> he goes, Tim Tollers. And we go <laughs> and the, we go in the classroom and we start praying. Yeah. And um, so we pray for like 30 or 40 minutes in the middle of the night in the classroom. And then we go back to sleep. It's just like, it just felt like, I don't know, there's a spiritual attack happening mm -hmm. amongst the brothers or something was happening. And then John came in that morning, uh, actually... Yeah, then the next, we got, all got up early and we went out to see the sunrise. Yeah. And the, the, the sky was completely red. Red. It was the whole thing was red. It was the weirdest thing. It was like we were on Mars or something. Yeah. And it was completely red. And then John came in that morning and he's like, what happened? You know, and, he, and we were telling him and he's like, I've been praying for you guys. You know, I was up, you know, at three in the morning, you know, praying for you guys. And he was talking about demonic activity and yeah. all this stuff. Yeah, all this That's crazy exactly stuff. what it was. And we were like all tripping out because we were like, I don't know, we felt like the Lord had showed up in that valley, like to come and protect us. And the the mystical sign was that the sky was red <laughs> and that the blood of Christ, you know, had like covered us. us. Yeah. And, uh, and again, all of these things are like ultra heightened. Like even as I say it, it's like hard to process, but it's like... Mm. When you're in that and you're working through that, you know, it's, it's, it's the same as you begging God to show up to pay, you know, for something maybe that's happened in life and you don't know if it's, if God's going to pull through and show up and then all of a sudden magically at the last moment yeah, that all of a sudden you're just, through. and you're like, are you serious? And you, you can't deny 
the awesomeness of your God. And it was one of those moments where we were like completely blown away. I just found a picture of us (laughs) um, rock rolling. Um, But I, I, I haven't found the picture of us. um, Look at this picture. dude. This is another rock. This was a, look at this. This is huge. Look at these guys, dude. Look at the crowbars. Look what we're doing. Billy. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Look at Eddie. Like, and we're just like, it looks like we're, look, he's, so Billy's in shock. We just dumped a boulder. It looks like over the side. Yeah. And Tim is like trying to record it. Eddie's just looking. I'm sitting there like, this is crazy. This is even happening right now. That was cool. But yeah, uh, probably way too much goofing off uh, in Mexico. (laughs) Yeah. But that was like half the fun of it. It was like, we were dead serious about Jesus. Yeah. We were dead serious about seeking the Lord and finding him there and yeah. then um, just continuing to have fun. And um, and John allowed a lot of space for us to be able to do that, yeah. just to have fun and to, to goof off. But and that's like the practical part that many Christians miss out. Dude. Mm-hmm. It's not just about all the serving the Lord and mm-hmm. doing the right things. Like, right. Dude, you got to have fun. Right. Have fun doing it. I right. think that's like one element that we have to learn to master. Like. Mm-hmm. It's okay to have fun serving God. Mm. Like, dude, it's okay to have some fun with the brothers and, yes. and the fellowship of the community, right? Of, yes. of the body. And I think that's something that a lot of people, I don't know, it's kind of hard to break out of that shell. And they right. feel like, oh, if you're at church, you got to dress up and sure. sit at your seat and right. listen to the pastor and, and go home. Right. No, have fun. Like, right. dude, get to know people and go out there and explore. And those are things that I feel like. The lot of the when I envisioned the early church, um, like forefathers to the disciples, I think they had fun, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, they bagged on each other, right? <laughs> like, for sure. Guy, John and James think right. like they're gonna get it. Right. It's like what the heck, right? You know, they mumbled and like, man, we're gonna get these guys, right. and they're always trying to get favoritism with the Lord. You know, yes. I think there is something fun about just growing, growing with the brothers. Like, yes, I think that's something that a lot of people needs to like have. Mm-hmm. But our times now, we're so like, just so in our own zone. And your cabin was the party cabin. It was. And you were not part of the original party I cabin. I was not part of the party cabin. <laughs> Reynolds was... and I, we, we, and Cisco and Thompson, Stephen Thompson, we were the party cabin, man. Yeah. You were in the father's. I was in the father's and cabin. And then what was the other cabin called? It, we called it like the family cabin. The family cabin with Billy and yeah. Martin. Billy and Martin. And Tim. Yeah. Tim. Oh, Nolan's man. in there. That was Eddie's a, in there. Yeah. That was a family. Yeah. Me, B. Jan, uh, Ben's in there. You were in the father's. Uh, right? Mike was in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The father's cabin. We would go to bed at like... On the dot. It was, like, guys, like, it was like 8 o'clock. Yeah, it was something ridiculous. I'm like, what in the world? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you we, still go to sleep that early? No. <laughs> but I do go to bed around 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah, wow. I can't, that's I can't, that's yeah. early, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, no, but um, yeah, the father's cabin was 8 o'clock. The family cabin was 9 o'clock. Yeah. And the party cabin was 10 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and so these are the different times. So you could pick which cabin you wanted to stay in, yeah. suiting your... And you guys used to play a, a game bang. called Bang. Bang, dude. Oh, Bang. What is this game? Explain this it game. It was a card game where it was kind of like mafia style. You had to kind of catch the, the outlaws. Uh-huh. And then there's a sheriff and the deputies. Yeah. And then there's that one renegade that has to kind of play until the very end. Yeah. And you shoot people. And you have all these like rules based it's a card limit, game. Yeah, limitations on your character. Dude, that was the one game we would almost get into fights over in the party cabin. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Dave Corson and I almost went at it. Dude. Really? Yeah. And we would pick on Phil so bad. Phil would be like, man, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Phil. Oh, Phil, dude. We love Phil. But yeah, that was the game. I still have it at home. It's still fun games to play. Um but it was it was a fun game, and then you know we converted you over after mm-hmm. a few months. Yeah, like hey, there's an opening here. I would sneak into the party cabin <laughs> and party. Yeah, we hung like toilet paper one time over. Remember, it yeah. was saying Coldplay. Yeah, and... we did a party for uh, for Reynolds. That's it was his birthday. It was. it was his birthday. And we got in trouble that night. We did. Bobby came and was like, "You guys need to go to sleep because we were singing at the top of our lungs. It's like eleven <laughs> o'clock, twelve o'clock at night, and like we're jamming like Coldplay and." <laughs> We got the box going, the box drum. We got the harmonicas going. We got the the guitars going. That's right. And we're just dancing and jamming. We have a photo from that too. We do. Yeah, that that's a cool photo. I always look back on that one. Yeah, 
and so we're we're going wild in the cab and we got in trouble uh because again you could probably hear us all the way across the valley you could because the the it's so dead silent out there there's no cars there's no light there's no nothing so if somebody yelled just like hey you know like across the valley you would hear them on the other side of the valley right because it's just flat and we're in this big you know um, yeah. valley of mountains around us mm -hmm. and so it would echo and we must have <laughs> the, whole, the whole the whole hito the whole time bobby came in that was the only night out of the whole time we're together right that he actually came in right hey, guys you guys knew and there's remember the toilet paper hanging all over the yes. thing and he probably looked at us like what in the world are yeah. these guys doing <laughs> <laughs> Were you always Randall pushing his shirt off? He was like <laughs> dancing in the middle. <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, we were all pushing the limits, you oh know. Oh my gosh! But man. having so much fun. That was fun. It was really fun. You gotta have fun doing it, though. That's, yes, that's the, that's the key. You no, I love. I think it's the third and greatest commandment: love God, <laughs> love one another, and get on enjoying life. There you go. Enjoy. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Yeah. I wonder what keeps people from enjoying it, you know? Mm. And that, I, I, again, it's probably a lot of bottled up things. Yeah. Yeah. Things that you probably need to let out and just let go of and let God heal you in that area. But I, I've been through that season. And, mm. it, and those are the times I think you and I conversed a lot mm. and we prayed for each other. Um, and once you're set free and you kind of move, you're able to enjoy things again. And that's kind of like where I am. I'm mm. finally in a season where I... You know, I, I'm able to breathe. Mm. It, it's not that I was angry or like having a difficult time, but mm. you know, kids, yeah. health, all that. Like you just, you, you get so caught up in the momentum of things. Right. And now I really believe that there is a sense of freedom mm. that I'm able to just take a deep breath and be okay. And I think that has a lot to do with, again, not feeling judged. Mm. I don't care about what people say anymore. Mm. <laughs> it's like, I don't care about how people look at me as a pastor, you yes. know? I mean, it's not that I'm careless and just yep. doing what I want type sure. of thing, but okay. It's not the fear of man. It's not the fear of man. Yeah. It's so weird that, and that's what we had in the most like purest, like in a sense, like purest, innocent form. Right. We didn't fear people. Right. We didn't fear each other. Yes. Yeah. And we enjoyed the time that God has given to us. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. You, Dennis, you grew up here in LA. Yep. In LA, so I mean, I was born, born in race. Korea. I was born in Korea. I, born in Korea. I was born in Korea. I came to the states uh, when I was nine. I was born. Um, I was. I, I'm, I'm a native to Cerritos. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I take pride in that. It's the yep. the most Orange County, LA city. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right next to Orange County, but it's, it's LA a great town. We took we took pride in being at the LA County. You know, mm -hmm. we we pay the LA County tax, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. I mean, I I that's where I grew up. So I kind of had. Would you go to high school? Gar. But I, I kind of went to Korea too. I, I, I got into a lot of delinquent, you know, I was, I had a delinquent childhood. Yeah. My parents weren't there around. So got into a lot of trouble. My parents were like, dude, you got to come home to Korea. Wow. And they brought me back to Did Korea. Did they really? Yeah, dude. They sent what me What town? To, it was a, it was a city called, um, Daejeon, mm -hmm. Um, and it was an international school. It was a Baptist Christian no way. international school. And I was not a Christian at this time, dude. Wow. I was not exposed to Christianity to that degree. How old are you? I was in ninth grade. Wow. Yeah. And You're like I, 13, 14? I was 13, 14. I was, yeah, in my young teens, I went there from LA and... You're kind of running in the streets here in LA, right? Yeah. Getting into trouble. I got into a lot of trouble here. So. And so your parents are like back to Korea. Yeah. And they sent me to a boarding school. <gasps> yeah. So it was again. I you know I, I look hear back. About this you know, I, Wait, what I, happened in there? Oh, it was crazy, dude. I mean, I got into my first like serious relationship. You wow. know, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Wow, it didn't work out. <laughs> it's not Rej. <laughs> right. So I mean, kind of all kinds of friendships that formed, and it was again kind of like Mexico, but was different. it a culture shock for you? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It was completely a different culture in Korea, yeah. and I think I. Just being a 1.5 generation, meaning I was I was born in Korea, but I grew up in the States and oh. now back. It's a whole different like mm. take. Like they don't see me as a native. Oh wow! But, you know, I'm, they see you as American. Yeah, and it's kind of, but I'm not really American either. Right. Like I have to kind of play this dual role and interesting fit in. But I think I at that point in adolescence, I brought in a lot of the LA wannabe like. Dude, I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm from the, LA. Yeah, I'm from LA. The, you better not mess with me type right, right. of thing. But right. I remember I the older guys, um, 
I wouldn't say it's hazing, but they, they wanted to put me in my place. Mm. And I remember there was a time when the seniors took me out. I was a freshman. Mm. They took me to this alleyway after school and they tried to beat me up and scare me straight. No. Up. Yeah, dude. I, there was moments like that too. And cause you know, they were like, dude, you can't just come up here and act right. like you're, you're somebody. Right. And they, <laughs> they, wow. I still remember. Yeah. So there was moments like that, but I, I, I stood my own, you know, on my own and, you know, through that, I still have good friends mm. that I still keep in touch with. We mm. play golf every month. And oh, it's cool. They're in SoCal now. So oh, wow. Yeah. So, it's, so you guys went to school in Korea, yeah. and now they live here in they Southern California. Because mo- all those who graduate there, mm-hmm. they go to the school in, in the States. They Got go it. To college and okay. university. So Got it. They ended up just residing in SoCal. So, so was that a good thing for you then? You know, um, I was supposed to go to a naval um, boarding school in San Diego or Whoa. Escondido, I think. Whoa. But they didn't let me in because I had a ACL and a torn ligament, mm. um, ACL surgery and a cartilage surgery. Mm. And so they were like, you can't, your son shouldn't join this because mm. I think it's going to maybe mess with his knees even more. Mm. And so with that, my parents decided to send me to Korea. Mm. So I think in hindsight, if I didn't go to Korea, I probably would have been some, I don't know, like even probably not with the Lord. Wow. I, I don't think so. So did, so... When you contrast the schooling here and the schooling there, would it and, and when you contrast, yeah, you said it was a Baptist school. It was a Baptist. Their school. private institution there, you know, versus our private institutions there. Yeah, yeah. What what was that like? You know, it's a it's a mix of the Korean super hyper like education focused school. Mm-hmm. I think they demanded a lot of the kids um, that went there. Mm-hmm. A lot of the kids went to, excuse me, great schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. It, it was still American high school. Like, I remember the dean, uh, Dr. Penlin, mm. he had a thing for me because he, <laughs> dude, I did some bad stuff there. Some <laughs> dumb stuff. <laughs> I think it was always, <laughs> I don't know what it was, man, dude. We used to just do dumb things there. And I pretty much, what was the final draw? Like, I, we were in a chapel room um, and I glued there was a glue gun that was plugged in they were like working on <laughs> and so i took the glue gun and you know we used to have overhead projectors it wasn't the lcd projectors yeah and so i somehow thought it would be cool to station the table to the carpet no. so i glued the table to the carpet it's like four <laughs> corners i don't know why <laughs> and doctor like somebody told on me uh-huh. and they made our parents pay for the whole carpet <gasps> In the St. Church, oh, no. in the chapel. Yeah. Because oh, that, when no. they lifted it up, they it ripped the carpet. And I think that was the final draw. My parents were kind of shocked. Like, what oh, yeah. the heck? Like, <laughs> why would you do so? I don't know what, what I was thinking. But I think that was yeah, the final boys, straw, dude. Young boys just yeah. do stupid stuff. Dude, it was a glue gun. It's I like, you got to use it somewhere. And I saw a table in front. <laughs> like, let's, let's try it. Let's see if it glues it. <laughs> We just like not even think. We just oh don't even think. Just, we weren't. I wasn't thinking. Just that. doing. And so I think that was the final draw. I was like, dude, dad, I cannot stay here. Mm. Like I'm gonna. And so they somehow allowed me to go back to the states, mm. and they brought me back to L.A. to Cerritos. Mm-hmm. And my brother was um, in UC Irvine at that time, so I lived with him. Mm. No parents. And that's kind of where I went back to Gar, and I finished off the school here. And oh wow, I. You know, and I think I got into more trouble at that time. And that was kind of my upbringing. Mm. I, I met my old friends. Mm. They just weren't into good things. And, yeah. you know, without parents, that's where, where do you find all your sure. belonging and identity? It's your safe place. And right. that was kind of the group of friends. And did the, did the private school or the Baptist school, did it plant any seeds of Jesus in you? None. None. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Dude, I, I mean, that's, but that's kind of, it, it's sobering for me Yeah. Like, to re- remind myself that when you're not in it, you're not going to hear it. Mm. You can't hear it. It just, mm. it goes right through you. We had to go to chapel every week. Wow. I don't remember a single thing, not a single thing. Wow. And I try to remember it, dude. I was like, man, I want, I really kind of want to recall these things. Yeah. Nothing. Wow. Yeah. Cause I was not in the Lord at that time, man. I was like fully disconnected and, and that, again, I think that's what led me to encountering or him encountering me mm. in such a powerful way. Cause How did it happen? Back, yeah, I came back and then um, I got, again, connected with my old friends. And long story short, dude, we were kind of doing some, again, dumb things. And yeah. I got in trouble with the law. Mm-hmm. I, got a, I, got, I got my DUI at, at the age of 20, I believe. Mm. And it was something more than a DUI. I kind of ran away from it. And mm-hmm. 
I got caught up. You know, it was like evading the police. Mm -hmm. I assaulted the guy that mm -hmm. I hit. Mm -hmm. Not to the severe degree. Yeah. I think I just reacted. Yeah. And I was like, uh, you know. If you don't know, Dennis is a, a <laughs> you would never know. Dennis is basically, no. he's basically no, a gangbanger. No, 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 no. Uh, he, 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 <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, uh, uh, Dennis is the kindest, generous, amazing, loving husband and father now. I received that. But yeah. when, <laughs> when, he, when he was young, he's a rough dude, you know? Uh, oh, you know, but, we all have our past. We all had to stand you, on our true. own, man. That's you know, true. we all had to stand on our own. And I made some dumb mistakes. And it's just ridiculous. Like, I remember, I, I only share this with this notion to, to point out, like, that was that point where I think I realized you really don't have many people around you other than, like, your family. Mm. Like, I, I remember going to jail. Mm. My parent, my mom was visiting at that time. She bailed me out. Mm. And I thought she was going to just beat me up, dude. I, mm. you know, it's like, oh, for sure. I, I, I was like. You're going to get whipped. Yeah, I'm going to get whipped. I, I, it's five in the morning. The, right. the, the, I think the, the bail guys, they drove me home. Mm -hmm. I remember it was still raining. And wow. I was like, dude, my mom's going to beat me up. Mm -hmm. I had nothing to say. I came home and my mom was like, you okay? Mm. And I was like, yeah. And wow. she's like, you know, get some rest. Wow. That's all she said. Wow. But those words, it's forever marked in my heart yep. as the, sh the element of grace. Yep. And I think that's where I really yep. experienced something mm -hmm. that I knew I didn't deserve. Pivotal moment. Yeah. And it really shaped my life. And and in that time, I was actually um, backslidden from church because I had kind of been in and out of ch at churches at that time. Mm -hmm. And I backslid mm -hmm. and I was like into drinking again and then... Mm -hmm. And boom, it was a divine intervention by God's grace mm -hmm. for me to get that. And it wasn't severe, right? And I, I did go to jail for a little bit, but it was house arrest at the end. Got it. But my mom and my family had to go through all this stuff to get me through this time. But God allowed that time for me to cry out and seek Him. Mm. I was like... My trial went for one year, mm. and this was like right after 9-11, mm. and obviously I wasn't a citizen. I was a green card holder. Wow. And I don't know if you remember, people were getting deported left and right. Wow. Bush was like deporting people. Wow. Anyone that did any type of felony, right. and you're not, you're not a citizen, right. we're going to revoke you, and we're, you're going to get deported. Wow. So if I, based on my conviction, I knew that my life could now forever change or be altered because if I get deported, I'm going back to Korea and I speak no Korean. <laughs> like, I don't speak wow. Korean, you know? What am I going to do? And I remember crying out to the Lord during those times. And I was like, God, I won't drink again until I turn 21. Wow. That was like six months away. Wow. <laughs> that was a big deal. It was a big deal, dude. I was like, Lord, <laughs> I, I will do my best. <laughs> I, I'm... I, all humor aside, though, oh, I you know, love it. God honor that. And, you know, yes. I kept that end of the bargain way longer, yes. obviously. I, it God. wasn't just like I went back to that. Right. You know, and I, God delivered me and the trial went on for one whole year. Mm. And I still remember the prosecutors when, when the judge read the verdict. It was no contest. And, and he dropped all my felony charges to a misdemeanor. Wow. Everything was a, literally, it was a slap on the wrist. It was wow. something crazy where the prosecutors were like, man, this is. They were just shaking their heads like, this is not right. Wow. And uh, thankfully, the other party um, didn't pursue any further charges. You know, they were older Korean gentlemen. I think he had a lot of sympathy for me as a mm. younger guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, everything just worked out. Mm. And I was in the church from that point on. Wow. That whole year. It was a humiliating, humbling time. Wow. You know, but I remember even during my house arrest, the funny thing is um, I had a full-time job. So when you're in house arrest, you can go to your work. Okay. And sometimes they'll allow you to go to church. Mm. But they allowed me to go to church three times a week. Wow. Which was Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. Wow. And so even during my house arrest, I was working 40 plus hours a week and going to church Amazing. three times a week. Amazing. It was something out wow. of the ordinary. So it was like almost normal life. Yeah, almost a normal life. Because it was you get, like, you're at church, you're yeah, with the people. I was with and the you're church. getting to work and make money. Wow. Exactly. And so But you're out of trouble. Yeah, out of, I'm out of trouble. Praise God. And so that's how my spiritual journey began to actually take shape. And obviously I wasn't deserving. I was still, you know, I had a lot to learn. And there was um, pastors that came around me, Pastor Brian. He's no longer here with mm. us. Um, he passed away due to COVID. But mm. him and his wife, Lisa, really invested mm. his life to to me and Rijay. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that forever shaped me. And actually, he was a Calvary Chapel Bible College student, like wow. an alumni. Wow. And so he knew when I talked about John, mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, I think you should sign up. I didn't think he thought I was going to get in. Wow. But he's like, yeah, I know, John. You should sign up for Crazy. it. Like, if you can get in, go for it. Wow. So he gave me the clear, like, green light, too. So wow. he was a very pivotal, um, these mentors that kind of come through your life mm -hmm. that really pivots and shapes you mm -hmm. to the right direction. And man, I'm forever indebted to him, man. He really helped me out. Yeah. Praise God for our fathers in the faith who take, took time to disciple us. These young, sloppy kids, you know, <laughs> but they see something else in us. I know, hey, man. You know, we look at these young 20 year olds now, and like yeah. these young, sloppy kids, you know. Seriously. It's like, we gotta, we gotta grab onto them. I'm not giving him the microphone, you know, like, you, gotta, you know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know if you should give them the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we say some crazy stuff. Well, you uh, let him talk, you know. When, um, I don't know, Dennis, like as long as I've known you, I've always seen you as a natural born leader, like that you, people just follow you. They want to hear what you have to say for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's just innately in you. Do you remember when you first saw that or first discovered that, that you knew that people were watching you or people would listen to what you had to say or you would take a step and do something and then they would follow after you. Do you remember, like, do you remember when any of this clicked? Do you know, I mean, it's so funny that you would say that. And I think you and Reynolds and even Rije, my wife would say that and test, attest to that. But naturally I never felt comfortable. Yeah. I've never felt like I had it. Right. And even now it's an internal battle. Right. And that's why I resolved to, okay, Lord, if anything happens, it's mm. you. Because mm -hmm. naturally, I think I would like to just step back mm. and not do much. Mm. Like, just kind of be in the background and love to support. I, I wouldn't mind being the Aaron and her. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. just be like, hey, I got you. Right. I got your arm. But, you know, I, I, so I, I, I wouldn't say, like, I felt like I had this thing. Mm -hmm. But even right after Mexico, I don't know if you recall, a lot of us went out and st started Bible studies. Right. You did it. Yes. Right out of the boba shop. You yeah. remember? Yes. Yeah. That yeah. and yeah. that was a. <laughs> yes. I don't know if you ever mentioned that. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Java bliss. Yeah, dude. That yeah. thing went on for a while. I, yeah. I mean, I remember going there sharing, and yeah. you know, for me, I started. I started the Wednesday night Bible study. Yeah. With just a bunch of my friends who didn't know Jesus, and mm -hmm. I just felt like you guys need to hear the word, mm. and they just gathered around the table, mm. and so. Even with that, I, I mean, hindsight, I'm like, okay, like God was definitely using me, mm -hmm. but I don't know if I really felt like I owned up to it. And mm -hmm. with that said, why I'm sharing this part is because sometimes the gifts that we have, other people see it better than we do. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that I have to feel like, well, I have this thing mm -hmm. and I, this is what I have to offer. And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's good to know your gifts and your strengths. Right. I think I know my strengths, right. like, but the ability to lead and to really be an influence and a, a tool for God. I don't know. Naturally, I still don't feel comfortable to be mm. say, to be very frank. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I have this thing, man. I, 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 I don't know what it is, though. I don't know if it's because you're... Um you it's a it's it's a prophet type you know you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna speak the truth you know you're gonna you're gonna say you're gonna say what needs to be said yeah it's gonna be encouraging or it's gonna be convicting like you're gonna take the risk yeah. and you're gonna say things to people um that most people won't say to people and i think it's mm. i mean it's powerful and it's like you did it in mexico you, you what i loved about mexico is is no one could be anyone except for who they were yeah <laughs> like and you, you could hide it for a little yeah. while but then like whoever you are it's just going to come out it's after a while out, it's going to come out like you're just living with these dude four months straight yep and i remember even telling myself like dude i'm just going i'm just going to hang up whoever josh thompson is back in riverside and i'm just going to try to just be i don't even know who am i really on the who am i really That's like so true i'm just going to be here and like, I, you get a brand new slate. You could kind of build out whatever personality you wanted. But what I found mm. is that because John broke the mold from day one, yep. like all of a sudden you were just naturally just being whoever you were on the inside. Yeah. And I love that because you go down the picture and you go down the line and you look at each one of the guys and you can, you, you have this picture of each personality and each gift, talents and abilities. Yeah. And um, I remember John said to us, you know, um, you, you just said it, you know, you can't, often see your own gifts, talents, and abilities. And the picture he would give, he says, it's, you know, it's kind of like the book of Acts, you know, when they're up in the upper room mm. and uh, they all had flames of tongues of tongues of right. flames over their head, but yeah. they couldn't see their they own flame. See, they couldn't see it. Um, but everybody else could see the Holy Spirit in them, but they couldn't see the Holy Spirit 
yeah. uh, on their head. And I thought that was powerful because it's, again, another picture yeah. but um, for a principle, but it's so true in our own lives. And um, you... You did you so you started the Bible study when you came back from Mexico yeah. and did that immediately kind of launch you into ministry into the yeah. church? It, it launched so it kind of paralleled with the church because my mentor Pastor Brian, um, who I mentioned earlier, he was he offered me the first youth position like, mm. as an intern pastor. This is at Glory Church at, Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we all say. <laughs> Glory Church of Jesus Christ of Latter. No, I'm, no. Kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> the real Latter Day Saints. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> That's yeah. We always make fun. But this of is like the biggest Korean church in LA. It is. It's it's a pretty big church right it's in the downtown. Bo- the boxing arena. It's a boxing arena. It's the Grand Olympic Auditorium. That's where we're at. Um, so it's a pretty big church. And he offered that youth intern position, and I just said yes because you know I, I I respected the man and mm. I really honored him as my mentor and mm. leader, and I just went with his um, guidance mm-hmm. and his covering. At the same time, outside of that, because you know it was part time, so it's. Right. I, I wasn't required to be there full time. Right. On the part time Wednesday nights, I started our home Bible study. Got it. And I remember having this vision in Mexico, like, you know, as John was like, go and pray and mm-hmm. seek the Lord. Mm-hmm. And I remember the Lord kind of giving me a picture of a park and mm. preaching the word. Mm. And just, I was like, that's what exactly what I'm going to do. Mm. And so I, I gathered up my friends and met at parks and, and ended up moving to our home. And mm. we just shared. And many good things came out of that. Mm-hmm. Man. And it, I think that really shaped me. And doing a house church. It was a house church. We went, I remember the first book we started from is First Samuel. Like wow. that was, I, I don't know how, I, I never, like how John shared on those, you know, in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. it really brought such big life, like pictures. It was like, dude, this is the book. Mm-hmm. It was still one of my favorite books to mm-hmm. read, First Samuel, First mm-hmm. and Second. And so we started on that and we went over all that and, Many of my friends began to serve with me at the church, and they're still good friends with me now. So it's really something that God did. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I remember we had to close that after three years mm. because I started working full time at the church, mm-hmm. and there was a pivotal time. I think I talked to you too. Like, do I go and start this Bible study and launch it as a church plant, right. or do I stay at this big church right. and and kind of remain in the church? Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I, I think these are the moments where I look back, I'm like, I wonder what it could have been mm-hmm. if I would have just went with that too. Well, the Lord used it all, right? I mean, you yeah. you became the English pastor there as well. Yep. And you started, you kind of birthed forth English ministry on a really high level yeah. within the church. We had lots of discussions around that, kind of um, the first generation um, coming to the States, oh, yeah. uh, the Korean community, and obviously finding deep community within the church yeah, that was and then huge. trying to figure out how to continue to reach the city of Los Angeles yeah. um, within the Korean community. And we had lots of discussions about that. And I always loved your insight because mm-hmm. again, like, um, I mean, I grew up in Southern California, but um, I'm not first generation. My parents aren't first generation. Yeah. And so kind of looking through the eyes of your culture, Dennis, and when your upbringing and Again, even even you telling me going back to Korea and then coming back to the States yeah. and kind of like you have multi layers of lenses that you see through mm. um, and you really give me a lot of insight into it. We'd have lots of discussions about this, about the church, how to reach people in Los Angeles. Yeah. And um, but you guys were doing it. You were really taking steps of faith to try to figure out how to minister. Yeah. Um, to the English community as well exactly. and, and to the next generation. Mm-hmm of Korean Americans. Yeah, that, that's so true. Because when we first started, there was a thing that all the older Asian um, pastors were sharing that there was a silent exodus in all the immigrant first generation mm. churches. And that was this exodus, silent exodus of the children who had grown up mm. in that church, but they were leaving. Mm. And they were leaving for the big churches, like the big American churches. Got it. And that's where they found their own faith. Mm. And um, in Heinz, now, maybe 20 years or so later, they're coming back. Wow. Because they're getting married, they're having children, mm. and they feel like there is some type of, you know, what they see is like, hey, this isn't where I want my kids to, the cultures are different right. still. Right. And and they're seeing, not, and I can't speak for everybody, but these are some studies that, you know, I've heard mm-hmm. that there are, 
there is a lot of people coming back with families now mm. that has once left the their first generation church. I see. And so, you know, I think that is something that, you know, I, I, I was able to kind of firsthand experience and I had a big desire to bridge that gap because mm -hmm. there was such a separation mm -hmm. from the first and second gens. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think I still have the answer for that, to be honest, at this time. You know, yeah. I think it's, it's one of these things that you just have to endure through it. And yes. I think in ministry, if you're called to it, Dude, that can be your grave. It's okay. Like yeah. even if it, if it's not the result you're gonna see, sure, it's okay to be like a Jeremiah and, mm -hmm. and stay up there and and see your end mm -hmm. and allow God's glory to continue. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes we give ourselves too much credit mm. to think like we're gonna do some great things and we're gonna see this great change, mm. but we do this in light of eternity mm. and it's not just about me. Mm. And I realize the older I get, I'm still young. We're like barely oh, yeah. 40, right? I mean, we're young, baby. We're young. We're yeah. young. So I think in light of what we're experiencing, like, I don't know if you would resonate as the less I see myself as significant, I'm, I'm just a little part of That's what good. God's big plan is. Yes. And I, I just need to be faithful at that. And I, I would love to kind of continue to encourage the next generation of leaders. Mm. It's not about the big things. I think our reference points of all these leaders that go on, on TV and social media, those mm. are great things and they can be doing great work. But all I, all I have to do is be faithful to what I need to be faithful to, That's man. Right. And you know, it's, I don't need to be the other person. I need to be me. That's right. And I think that's where, again, my desire and my passion is to help people discover that you, you know, God created you very purposefully mm. and uniquely. Mm. And if you get more comfortable in your, who you are, then man, all the more God's going to get the glory. Mm -hmm. so you're going to see like, it's God who empowered you to do that. Yeah. When, when you reflect on LA and kind of all that's happened, like the last, like, you know, when, when I say this, even, oh, yeah. it's like, what, what is, you know, the last three years, you know, Los Angeles, Southern California, uh, ministry, mm -hmm. churches, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't even have a specific question, but like what pops into your head, like when you reflect on all that's happened, like yeah. um, to the church, you know, what what's going on in Christianity, you know, from your eyes, you know, oh, from, from Southern California. There's, there's so many things happening in Christianity, bro. I mean, yeah. we can go into so sure. many different ways, but I commend the church's for being faithful. Mm. I think that's one main thing that I would like to exhort the churches of is like pastors. It was crazy. We went through a season of shutdown right. and being told by the government how to do church, right. like what to do and what not to do. We've never experienced that in our lifetime, at least. Right. That's crazy. It was. And for churches to stay faithful to their call mm. and to open the doors mm -hmm. and to continue to preach and proclaim the gospel and be the place of shelter and, mm -hmm. and, and of help to many of those that need mentally mm -hmm. even. I think that mental instability was a big thing during totally. that time. It definitely brought out all, you know, everyone being stuck at home, right. working from home. Like right. it's crazy. Like right. that's going to bring the worst out of you sometimes. Right? right. And so the church to be faithful in those times to mm. continue, I think that's, that's huge. That's really, I commend those people and the pastors and the staff and all the congregations that, stayed faithful to that. So do you think we've recovered as a society from all that? Hard to say. Yeah. Because in hindsight, I know many churches that closed the doors. Sure. And it's, it's, it's really sad and it's kind of discouraging right. when you really look at that too, right? Not everyone had the same experience as right. maybe you and I have. And I think that's, it's not to say that God wasn't faithful. It just, man, I hope that they don't lose heart, right. you know, in, in these seasons. And right. Yeah. So I, I don't know if we are fully out of it, man. And I think there's still a lot to come, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, think we're just, we just scratched the surface of things. I right. think there's a lot more coming down the pipe, man. That's going to. Dennis, what do you think has happened? Um, you know, I mean, we talk about this from time to time, but it's like, um, I think with social media, with kind of where our culture's at as a whole um, community, society, yeah. people connecting, um, friendships, relationships, yeah. you know, what, I, I can't put my finger on exactly what's happened, but it does, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it feels like something is off. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you and I don't, we haven't experienced that. Yeah. Like we grew up 
Like if we're even dating our, you know, our wives, right? We're, we went up to them, right? Like, hey, yeah, how's it going? How's it going? <laughs> yeah. It's not like we had to create our, our own profile page and right. like this is what I like, right? You know, and I saw some profiles on Hinge, and I was like, Hinge is a dating app. Okay, and I, 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 my old student, I'm like, you're on Hinge. Let me look at what it is. Yeah, yeah. And they even have like voice clips of really? them like saying, and I'm like, whoa, this is like. Having to go through so many different, like, even meeting people like that, right? And I'm, like, telling our church people right now, I'm like, dude, can you guys just talk to each other? Wow. Brothers, come here. Right. It's okay. Talk right. to the sisters. You can sisters. talk to the girl. <laughs> <laughs> go introduce yourself. Seriously. Yeah. I, I think the brothers. And they're like, how? What do yeah. I do? It's like a, it's like a dance. It's, yeah. like a, it's like a high school high dance. High school dance. Yeah, they're all standing no, on the sides. No, seriously. It's literally l just like that. Yeah. Like, all the guys sit together with the guys and the sisters together. with. The, I'm like, dude, come, come on. Yeah. Come on, get over here. It, it's funny, you know, but I think we don't know to the degree of what our current generation is really like going through. Right. That's really what social media is. And our kids' generation, they're going to, you know, not my kids, hopefully, but. They're going to be in that, immersed yeah. in that. Right. And that's how they're going to connect with people. Right. And so I myself don't go on social media like like in that sense where I don't post things and yeah. things like that. But it's definitely the you norm. Feel, you feel free? I do. Yeah. 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 I just feel like, hey, this is not, you know. And obviously you, you, you probably saw John. Yeah. His last post. Yes. On YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that awesome? Dude, this guy has a... A rotary. A, a rotary phone. I was like, a rotary was, phone. That was something new. I was like, you have a rotary phone? Dude, it's <laughs> awesome. John's like, I don't have Facebook. I've never had Facebook. I don't have Instagram. I've never had Instagram. I don't have MySpace. I never had MySpace. Yeah, dude, John. I don't uh, have a YouTube. I don't, uh, I don't have any of this stuff. Because uh, anybody who posted it would post for him. So John doesn't have access to any of it. But he's like, I don't even have a cell phone. Seriously. So you can't reach me. Uh, it's a rotary phone. He's like, but you can call my house if you want to, and I'll pick up. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, I don't have a voicemail, uh, so you can't leave a message. Oh, my God. But you can just call, and I'll pick up the phone. Yeah. And you can talk to me. Yeah. And But again, John's making a joke. Like, he's, he's kind of, you know, being light about it. But he's saying like a thousand things in between the lines. Oh, for sure. He's I, basically saying... I'm living a thousand percent in the moment. Yeah. And if the phone rings, I'm going to pick it up and I'm just going to talk to whomever it is. I don't have caller ID. I don't know who it is. I can't not answer because I don't like that person. I don't want to talk to them right now. <laughs> I just have to pick it up and I'm just going to talk with them. And I don't know how long the phone call is going to be. And there is no voicemail. I'm not getting back to anyone. So if I'm out at the grocery store and I, the phone rings and I don't get it. I don't even know that you called. And uh, it's not up for me to, to figure that out. Exactly. He's freed from all of Seriously. the pressures of, of digital pursuit. You know, emails and text messages and phone calls and social media posts and DMs. And just like it just doesn't, notifications just doesn't stop. He's free of all of this stuff. And he's just like, but that's classic John. Like he doesn't even have like a like a 1999 or a 2000 phone. He has to go rotary. Like he's got to go like exactly. 1950s, like <laughs> kink, kink. That's so kink. That we, is, we used to have one of those. I know. That's My I grandma mean, had one. A lot of us did growing up. That was a normal thing. But now it's like, you know, but being bombarded with all the demands. And that's exactly what the world wants us to do. It wants to dumb us down and make us full focused on whatever it is, the news is that they put up. And mm. not to say, you know, again, it, it's just, you know, I think these are things that the, the world entraps us mm. and keeps us in line. Mm. And I don't think that's the way of the gospel. Mm. I don't think that's the way of Christ. We are going through the narrow gate mm. and we are have we have to be countercultural mm -hmm. and we have to walk in the line that he created for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the hardest thing because totally. you're going to look weird <laughs> doing totally. it. You're going to, it's, you're not going to feel like you're going to fit in this mold, but right. that's exactly the line that God is calling us to right. live. And if people feel comfortable of who they are, I think that's going to be okay. And it's not to say, well, you can't have social media because I have Instagram. I have, right. I have Facebook. Sure. But 
Does that like you're in touch and in tune yeah. with what's going on, but you're choosing what to interact with and what not to like, you're kind of setting boundaries. There you go. Yeah. And I think it's a fine line that we walk on that. Yeah. It's, it's not to say you can and cannot do, right. you know, John kind of taught us and we always revert these teachings back to John, the principles that he laid again. It's like, Hey, if you have any doubts about it, mm. don't do it. Mm. Remember that? And he taught us that. He said, if you have any doubts about it, if you have some type of inner doubt about it, just don't do it. Mm-hmm. Why bother? Just and he kept it so practical. Yes. And if you kept, if you stick to that principle, all things are lawful, but not all things, things are, are profitable. Profitable, man. And it's like when you see that, and mm. it's like he really laid some foundations in our lives that forever changed mm-hmm. and set us on the mm-hmm. path, you know, where we are today. So. I still remember that. Well, John used to say something like, boys, you need to be, you're going to be, uh, yeah, so ancient, you're brand new. You know, <laughs> so ancient, you're the newest technology on the planet. You, He's so ancient, you're so different. Dude, this and the is latest, 20 years ago. Yeah, latest trend. 20 years ago. This is 20 years ago now. You know, John told us in Mexico, he said, uh, but he did say, you know, if I was to do it again, you know, I would, I would, I do a podcast or, you know, I, I would get the podcast thing going because, you know, it seems like a new opportunity to just put the word out there. He's talking about like radio, yeah, like yeah. K-Wave, like he, he would just put his sermons out there. So as soon as I got home, I started Godcast. Oh, I remember that. It's still there, Dennis. Oh my gosh, dude. In like 2005, dude. Like <laughs> you can hear me like 2005, it's called Godcast on iTunes. Mm, I don't know if we should. <laughs> uh, it's, you might it, need to filter yeah. through things, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, viewer discretion, listener discretion you advice. I'm a out. crazy man, dude. You listen to me, I'm fresh out of Mexico and I am spitting fire. Like, I am like. Everyone at Harvest thought you were a little bit. They thought I was crazy, dude. <laughs> They thought I was crazy. I mean, for sure. Like, I mean, every, I mean, multiple people would come to me and say, like, we were kind of waiting for you to like land, you know, like you were, <laughs> your plan? yeah, you were like flying around, like you were in the clouds, you know? Yeah. And it's true, man. We were in such a like weird heightened spiritual experience that when we came back, society didn't feel normal. You know, we felt like we were, we, we didn't fit in, you know? Yeah. And, um, but again, John would challenge us to stay ancient, you know, no, um, sure. stay, stay in the word. Dennis, you've been married 13 years, 13 years, Only 14 now. You and Rije are Crazy. awesome. Yeah. We and, are very fortunate. Um, and you've got two kids, um, love to hear any gold, any, uh, silver, any bags, yeah. uh, that you want to pass ac- across the table. Maybe things that have like been really refreshing and a blessing for you and Rejay things, patterns of things or things that you guys have done that have just really refreshed mm-hmm. the marriage or blessed the marriage and things that you guys love to return to, yeah. or, um, I don't know, maybe epiphanies that you've had over the years, like, man, you know, like it, it, it took me a while to figure this out, but once I did, you know, it, it, it caused this, you know, something great in our marriage, oh, something wonderful. Yeah, for sure. You know, by no means our marriage is not perfect. Um, any marriage comes with issues and problems that you have to work out. And I think that's something that we all need to go into marriage knowing Mm -hmm. like you're going to, this is when the real things really come to the surface Mm -hmm. and it's in that confrontational or accountability. And I think for me, Rijay, just being the woman she is lover of God, and she really took a lot Mm -hmm. of blunt force and Mm -hmm. carried the weight with me. Mm -hmm. And I think as a young pastor, she, you know, Three months into our dating, I came back. I was like, "Dude, I'm I'm for sure going into the ministry." Now. <laughs> it's like, you, you ready? <laughs> you know, and I think she at a, early on she she tells people that she's like, "You brainwashed me when I was mm. kid." She was so young; she right. was like 19. Wow, dude, I was right. 22. Wow, you know, it was yeah. crazy. So yeah. I'm like, "We're gonna serve the Lord. We're gonna go all in for yeah. Jesus." Wow. And obviously, man, our thoughts were very short-sighted, but by the grace of God, man, like he preserved our marriage. Mm. Like he really blessed us and and did a lot for us and provided the way for us in every way. Mm. I think one thing that I, I would say, the, the good things is for sure, like, man, because we both were aligned together mm. in loving Jesus mm. and our goals were pretty clear, like mm. we're going to serve the Lord mm. in every capacity, in any capa- any circumstance, that really set the tone for us. Mm. And it kept us grounded. Even when things were getting difficult, we yeah. just we were able to go back to the source, to That's the good. foundation. But at the same time, I, I remember having Nora for the first time, like our first child, we... That's when things started like kind of 
even getting even more crazier. Right. Because I, we were, I was commuting an hour to go to church. Right. Rije was working full time. Right. We had our first born. And so I felt like everything was spread thin. Mm. Like I'm doing my church thing. Rije's doing the housework right. and working full time. I don't right. know how she did both. Right. And so Nora at an early age had to have a nanny, mm. go to daycare right. like all day from morning till like five or 6 p.m. Right. And so there was that moment. And I think in that moment, a lot of my internal buildup, mm. it, it, it got worse. Mm. And so a lot of my stress, even though I was doing pretty well at church, mm -hmm. at home, it was a, I couldn't hold my stuff. Right. And I think that's when we also conversed a lot yes. during that season. Yes. And I think having people like you and accountability mm. helped me to mm. be very grounded. Mm. But I think if I didn't have that, mm. I don't know. I mm. think that's another thing that I, I had to kind of really in hindsight, really look back and think about. And ultimately that led me to stepping away from Glory Church mm -hmm. after 14 years. Wow. And, and I think that really kind of was like, okay, I think this is a season where I need to step back. Mm. And I took a sabbatical um, and I got a full-time job. I was mm. working. That was a hard step. It was. It, it was definitely. That's but, my home church. But you but you, you took the risk yeah. for your family. Yeah. And I, I think that was one thing that I realized. I was kind of blindsided because I always thought, like, I'm doing God's work. Right. So, Rija, you're doing what you can right. to support and to be there as a mom mm -hmm. and even work. And I, I think that's an oversight on my end that I didn't catch until mm. that point. Mm. And I needed to man up mm. and I needed to provide mm. for the family and wow. be there. And so it sounds a little, you know, I, I think it, it, I don't think my situation is across the board relatable to everybody. Sure. And, and it has to be this way. Well, but for me, I knew I had to step away from the pulpit. Sure. Because I had two different lives. But it's honorable, Dennis, because that is such a difficult thing to do for any pastor, for any minister, right? To literally say, you know what? For the health of my marriage and my family, I'm going to do the right thing that I feel God's calling me yeah. to do. It's so hard to say no to the church, no to ministry, no oh, to yeah. And you say, like, I'm just going to step away. Like, yeah. Like even me saying that, and it's not even a reality for me, <laughs> scares me, right? It's like, hey, Legacy, I'm just going to step away for a year. They'd be like, what? Yeah. Everybody lose their mind, dude. Yeah, dude. It was... you, you know what I mean? It's like, but that listening to the Lord, listening to your wife, yeah, you know, saying, you know what? It's time. This is what I need to do for my family at this time in this moment. Mm. It doesn't mean no forever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what the Lord has, but it's just like, I got to do this. Exactly. And you did it. I did it. And so I, I think to say, to give the credit, it was really Rije being able to voice up her desires and her needs. Mm. She's been so, such a compliant wife wow. for so long. Shout out to Reach. You know, yeah. Thank you, Reach. I love you. Um, but at the same time, like after 10 years, she started really sharing. Yeah. I think that does that happens. In it, time. it does. Like after some time, they get comfortable enough. Like, I'm going to tell you what you don't want to hear now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know and for me it was 10 years gonna get for, you. Some, for some it's mm -hmm. a lot earlier uh -huh. and a lot sooner yeah you know but for me uh, for us it was 10 years and she started really discovering her own voice mm -hmm. and you know i just you know, knew. Kay katie just told me this recently Dennis, and she said it's the joke you always tell at weddings and it's like in the first year of marriage the man speaks and the woman listens <laughs> And the second year of marriage, the woman speaks and the man listens. <laughs> and the third year of marriage, they both speak and the neighbors listen. <laughs> and, um, oh, and, and, dude, and no, cause Katie was sharing this with me. She's like, well, I was nervous. You know, I'm nervous. A lot of the years, like I'm scared to speak up and say things because I don't want to cause more problems. I don't want to mm. disrupt the, the family unity. I don't want to yeah. disrupt our marriage. And so it's easier just to stay passive and be more compliant. And then eventually they do. Our <laughs> wives find their voice and uh, we will hear. Exactly. <laughs> Love you, babe. I know. We cannot avoid. So when that happened, I had to stop and make a decision. Mm. Am I going to ignore and say, well, no, I'm called to this mm. reach. Mm. This is my calling. Mm. You got to take it or leave it. And I, I know older pastors that take that route. Sure. And I'm like, but I just knew, you know, Timothy, if you can't manage your own household, right. you, you shouldn't be in it for now. And You're so good man I, I took that and I was like, you know what? I had to own up to my shortcomings, yeah. my short-sightedness and my end of the bargain as a husband to take and uphold this family. So mm. I had to get a job. I got a job um, and I worked. Mm -hmm. and, and I during that time, we 
started a Bible study too. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so we we're still doing ministry. Yeah, we're still doing ministry. We kind of opened up our home, and it was probably very liberating, man. Mm. It was a breath of fresh air. Not to say that my old church was not. Right. It's, it just I needed something outside of the the the, the walls right. per se, and it really really blessed our marriage. And I think just kind of sharing from my experience, listen to the wives and mm. listen, um, especially those in leadership, whether it be deacons or elders mm -hmm. they and pastors, mm -hmm. like, we need to listen to our wives yes. and we need to really help them be heard mm. and be there for them. Mm. And I think that's something that I'm learning as a, as a younger husband now and just kind of coming um, into this seasoned years, the 40 mm. to the 50s. Mm. I'm looking forward to that, man. I yeah. think this will be a very unique season yeah. of our lives that's going to shape that. It's such a good word yeah. um, because we, you don't, it's like you don't even realize you're not listening until you realize you're not listening. Yeah. Like you don't even realize that you're hearing what your wife is saying, but you're not listening and you can't even discover that. You, you literally can do this I felt like it was a pattern of for at least five to seven years for mm -hmm. me, honestly. I don't know what Katie would tell you, but, um, <laughs> but then, you know, I've been an idiot many years, Dennis, and I'm on the phone with you saying, dude, yeah. what do I do? And you're exactly. like, do this, 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 you <laughs> idiot. You know, like, what are you doing, dude? Um, and I need that counsel and I need that. I need those words, but it's such a good word. You said, you know, she needs to know she needs to be able to say that she's being heard. Yeah. She needs to be able to declare that. Oh yeah. Not you saying, I hear you. Yeah. That's not enough. Yeah. She needs to say, I believe that you hear me. Mm. I believe that I'm completely being heard. Mm. And uh, yeah, it messes me up because it's like, I, I make my voice heard. Yeah. I and make naturally my, I make, our voices are just, it, it happens. I, I don't mean to, but it, it, it overpowers them a lot of times, right. our wives. Right. And they are the ones that's holding the fort. <laughs> with kids. It's, well, especially the pastor's voice. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. You try to pull the pastor card in your own house, you know, you're like, <laughs> you're like I'm going to preach a sermon right I now. Know. Like, no, you're not. Uh, oh, marriage. But man. man, these are the realities of all pastors homes. I, I would think so. For centuries. Yeah. You know, during when I left, I talked to some pastors and it was really sobering and helped me to process that I wasn't alone. Mm. And I think Rijay's heart too, both of our hearts are ultimately for even church leaders mm. because I feel like we've been through some stuff, mm -hmm. not like we overcame everything. Right. We've just been through it right. and we're able to empathize and understand mm. and create that safe place for them because so many leaders don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. What can they do? They mm -hmm. have to stick it through for the church. They mm -hmm. have to just endure through it. They have no support. They have no brothers right. or sisters that's going to come alongside and cover them. Yes. It, it's That's the reality for so many. Mm. And so I want to continue to be an advocate for church leaders. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you're right. <laughs> it's just, it's, we, we're very fortunate to have that. Yes. Yeah. You have two kids. I do. They're they're amazing. Nora's second grade now, um, and Isaiah is four. That boy is wild. How have your kids? <laughs> how have they changed your life? What has it done to your eyes? What has oh. it done to your heart? Like what is uh, what is, what has God shown you and your kids? Or what are you learning in parenting? Oh uh, man, yeah. You know, it's funny. Like God has a way of teaching us such. I'm right behind you. Yeah, he <laughs> he has a way of showing us our ways through our kids in so many ways. Like, I can't believe how similar they can be. Mm -hmm. And and it can trigger you mm -hmm. in the worst ways. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, you cannot do this. Right, <laughs> and, right. You know, because I struggle with it. You better not struggle with right, it kind right, of a thing. Right, but right. overall, when I see them beyond even all those things, it's like, wow, God has trusted two souls mm. in my care. Wow. Like, they're completely depended on me and Rije. Wow. And I think having to go through that cancer scare, like possibly all these different things, we literally in Korea lived out of a suitcase for mm. two and a half months. Mm. And during the, the South, like that weather in Korea is super humid. It's like Texas probably, mm. like 100% humidity, 90 wow. degrees out. And it was brutal. Mm -hmm. And 
one thing that was probably the biggest challenge was we were with our kids mm. morning till night, dude. Wow. No school, 24/7. no like after school class, no activity. It was just wow. like family time. Right. But you know what that did? That brought us together. Mm. And it taught Rije and I that we don't need a lot to enjoy things. Amen. It's so crazy. You know, we have our homes and all, like, we have a whole room dedicated to their toys. Not that we have even toys. We have a playroom right, right. with books and toys. I'm like, we don't need that. Wow. We, he had, like, a Hot Wheel. Right. We, <laughs> we bought him, like, a robot, one robot that he could carry around. <laughs> Nora had a doll. Yeah. But just seeing them enjoy the presence of their family. Wow. I think that opened my eyes, mm. like, it, to another degree. Mm. Like. Because, you know, in the States, like, we want to do everything. We want to make sure they get the right teachers. We want to make sure they have the edu- – like, all the supplementary things that they right. can succeed in life. But I think the, in the foundation years, like, in their stages that they're in, they just need me. Mm-hmm. They just need Rijay. Mm-hmm. And they need my full attention and mm-hmm. presence. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when I'm here, when I was in Korea, I didn't really have that. Like, I was just in the moment, mm-hmm. just – I didn't have much agenda. I was like, again, in a, like two and a half months of vacation, mm. have, waiting for my surgery to take place. But in the States, we're always like, what's coming next? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the next thing? And right. we're caught up in all these things. But when our kids, they just, they're so present, man. Like, you won't ever experience that in the moment thing like a child. They're just there. Like, dad, mom, come here. Look right. at this. Yeah. Like, what? Look at my poop. Yeah. <laughs> look how big it is. <laughs> look at that bug. Yeah, look at that bug. Yeah. I'm like, oh, man, that's so... But, you know, that's like... It, it, I need to do that. Yes. We need that as adults. Right. Why? Well, I, I had to stop and wonder, like, why is it not significant for me anymore? Right. Why is that so, like, oh, okay. And I go back to my phone sometimes. Right. But I'm like, dude, we have to... Like, it really opened my eyes in Korea during this like waiting period mm-hmm. to just cherish a child like faith and life that they offer us so good yeah i think that's god's way of really reminding us again like we have this not a second chance but it is like another opportunity for mm. us to redeem mm. possibly the things that we didn't get that we get to kind of support that and yes. even open it up for them even all the more to mm-hmm. serve. One thing that's really a blessing, like we had some guests over yesterday on Monday night. And then literally the first thing Re- Nora does is she gets her Bible out, like the kid's Bible. Mm-hmm. It's like the beginner's Bible with the photos. Yeah. And she sits the, the guest down and she just reads. And she, like even this morning, I'm taking her to school. She's reading about Jacob and Praise Joseph. God, dude. And she's just like, oh, I love this story about wow. Joseph and, and Jacob. And I'm like, dude, it just blew me away. Wow. I'm like, what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even catch her that she brought the Bible in the car and I'm Amazing. taking her. But just seeing how girl. God is moving in those subtle ways, like it blesses me. Mm. And I, it's in my responsibility to cherish that and capture this mm-hmm. rather than like get, get on with my life. Right. Get on with the next thing I need to do. Right. Right. And I think... That's the blessings that our children bring. Obviously, the older ones will say probably different. They're like, just wait till they become teenagers. <laughs> hey, Dave and Chris over here like, we got oh, some teenagers. Oh, hey. dude. Dave and Chris, you guys are the wise. <laughs> but, but they're also nodding at the uh, at the, the babies, man. Yeah. The little, the little kids. You know, like I know for sure. It's I like how you said, Dennis. Like, it's almost like, I don't know. You know, you experience life one way. You get married and they experience life another way. And then you have kids and it's like, you have another chance to like, like see God, like, and see life in a new way. And it's like, it is, it's wild that your children can force you to simplicity. Yeah. And I just started reading this book called the good life Mm. and it's, um, David Wong, uh, sorry, Daniel Wong, uh, Mm. uh, Daniel, shout out to Daniel. Uh, thank you for the book. Um, he encouraged me to to read it and to go through it, but it's talking about community, mm. and it's like I don't know if it's Harvard or Stanford or you know one of the one of the the major Ivy League schools uh, have been doing a study. It's like over eighty years or longer wow. on communities and people, and it's like thousands of people are involved in this study, and they're talking about like what truly makes people happy and what really makes people have the good life. Mm. And the first chapter goes off to say you know like. Our pursuit is basically fame, 
money, success, you know, all these exterior yeah. things. And we believe once we have these certain things in place, then we're going to be like mm. truly happy. But they're the heart of the book is back to like simple community. And they start, they're, they're going to start to unravel like the circles of community and that like, basically you're, uh, you're in a never ending pursuit. I think of finding true, meaningful mm. connection. Yeah. You want someone to know you want someone to love you. You want, you want to, and it doesn't matter what you have. Yeah. It's like, if you're just around a campfire, but those people know you and love you and you don't have anything else mm -hmm. or you're in Korea and like, it's just you and your kids. And like you, they, that's the beautiful thing about these little babies is like, dude, they have a laser focus on you. Like yeah. from the moment they're born, they're just like, all I want is mom and dad. All oh, yeah. I want is mom and dad. All I want. And it. Sadly, it becomes annoying to us, you know, in the process. It's like, what's wrong with me, you know? But then other times you have glimpses and you're like, God, like all I want is you too. You know, like you're the best, like you're the best thing that's ever happened. You know, it's like yeah. these little kids are so full of joy. They just want to play. They, they just want to hang out and have fun. They don't, they, they, you know, they cause all kinds of problems in our lives. They cause all kinds of frustrations. But it's amazing to watch their pursuit of pure life. Yeah. Like like purest community, purest. right? Purest love, purest connection. Mm. And it's the best when you get to laugh with them and have fun with them. And it's the best when they um, start to enlighten you. They do something radical like, yeah. you know, tell you a story of the Bible or start to tell you things about God. And um, this, you know what I mean? It just starts blowing your mind. But it's like... I too am discovering this, Dennis. I'm like, I'm just starting to see it again more this last year than ever before. Um, you know, I have so many outer connections, but like, I'm starting to see like the attraction, uh, more than ever before to the inward connection with my family and how life giving that is. Yeah. And just, it doesn't have to be anything. It doesn't have to be much. It's just being with my wife, being with my kids, and just enjoying them. Why is that so rich to me? Why does that minister so deeply to my soul? Why is that so refreshing? Why is that so awesome? Um, we were designed yeah. to do this. Exactly. And uh, it's not uh, it's not random that God is referred to as our father mm. and that there is deep relationship uh, involved. And so, um, yeah, man, I'm like... <laughs> As you're saying it, I'm just trying to soak it in, trying to figure out, you know, yeah, what this looks like in real time and trying to figure it out, but really trying to slow down and cut off all the exterior and just, yeah, we don't need thousands of toys. We don't need more technology. We don't need more experiences. We The, the experience we're looking for is just a genuine connection with oh, for the, sure. the child right in front of me. Dude, we went through that two and a half months out of a suitcase, as we mentioned, like, mm -hmm. And we've never experienced anything like that in our entire life. Mm. And this was something that God had ordained mm. for me to be immobile, wow. in, in a sense, like wow. stuck in Korea. I was with my parents. Mm. And you're contemplating life. Yeah. Rijay was even worse probably than me. She's mm. like, what if I lose my husband? Mm. My, my, you know, and all those things were going through. All I right. think for me as a recipient of that, I just kind of embraced for it mm -hmm. and i just went with whatever it is okay right. we got to do a surgery we're going to do a surgery let's right. go i didn't think much more than that like i just needed to be ready for it i think rejay is she's thinking about all the possibilities so mm. i give a lot of credit to rejay as just the wife I man she held the fort and mm. and i think you know i'm so fortunate to have someone like her because she really went through the fire, mm. you know, and mm. during the surgery too, just to kind of give you an insight, it was supposed to be two hours. Mm. It was like five hours. Yeah. I was the first surgery in and I was like one of the last ones out. Wow. Yeah. And the, and the doctor was like, it's, it was bigger than anticipated. Wow. It was deeper in my kidney. Wow. It was closer to the arteries. Wow. And so he brought the tumor <gasps> out. Bro. He brought the cancer. He was like, here. No. <laughs> like proud of his work to <laughs> and she, Yeah. And RJ was like, oh my gosh. But he was like, you know, your husband's fine. Like Crazy, we, everything man. went well. But that was probably a big monument in our in our family history now. Like it's going to be a point where God met us and wow. really encountered us in such a way where he reminded us that, you know, you don't need all these things in life. 
you know, we we all want it. I want it. Right. <laughs> like, I, yeah. want, I, want, I, I want it. I want the the nice, good life yeah. of like American, you know, I really do. That's right. what I want to preserve. Right. But we experience like, no, you don't need that. It's good. You just need to have each other and most importantly, the Lord in the midst. And he leads you and he will guide and provide for you. Mm. And I think that was probably the biggest lesson we came out in this season. And so we're actually approaching this our life um, with the new take mm. of like, okay, Lord, you're 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 stirring something up. Where is it? Show me the way. Show us the way. Mm. And that's how we're taking our life right now. It's mm. like, dude, and it's really set me free. Mm. I think it's kind of crazy, but it's like, okay, Lord, if you allow that, and I might not have what I like here, it's okay. Mm. I'm gonna be okay with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I have what I need. Yeah, I have what I need. Again, it's it, it's not natural. I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna go and seek for it. Like sure. I'm gonna just burn everything out. But right. in my heart, like I determined. Mm. Okay, what's more important is I have Jesus and my family, mm-hmm. and we're gonna serve the Lord. Mm. So that's what it boiled down to. Mm. And so I'm really enjoying my family. Um, Isaiah came into our room as he usually does to pee. He's he can't. <laughs> Yeah. He can't go to the restroom by himself, man. This Boys. boy, man, he's yeah. like, Daddy, like, it's four in the morning. Dude, go to the toilet. <laughs> it's like, Daddy. And I got to hold my hand and hold his hand, uh-huh. pees, and he's like, I don't want to go back to my room. Uh-huh. I was like, come in. Yeah. And, you know, but it's it was kind of interesting because my parents, <laughs> they when I was like his age, mm-hmm. they never let us sleep in their room. Right. They would lock their doors. Right. And I was like, dude, man. I know. That's, I had like memories like that, right? But now I get to kind of redeem that. Yes. I'm like, you're always welcome. It's the like, best. Come, come lay with me. It's the best. You know, it really is. Yeah. And then, yeah, I was just kind of reminded. Yeah, we try, we, go, we go to bed with no kids and wake up with a bed full of kids. Dude, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of the best. It is. It, you wake up. My little like, guy's right next to me. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It is. And so I got to experience that even this morning. And I'm like, man, God you know you you're faithful mm-hmm. like you allow me to experience these redemptive moments mm. you know and learning to hold my peace because last night dude it was a battle trying to get him to wash brush his teeth yeah yeah or brush his teeth yeah, yeah I, like, I know i was like you gotta go to sleep buddy like brush your teeth and he's like no i want mommy <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> You know, you go to sleep. I, I, oh, I, I like, know. Dude, I have the same thing. Brush dude. your teeth, man. I know. <laughs> oh, my the God. The war of teeth brushing. Oh. It's so funny, man. Nora's so good, but Isaiah's different, man. Yeah. This guy, boys, they, <laughs> they're a little different. Yeah. You know, the wars of these battles, these oh little kids. It will, it will push you to the edge, man. And then you go away later and you just feel so bad. You're just like, God. Yeah. Help me to be yeah, patient with your kids, man. And then he came to my bed last night. So I'm uh-huh. like, All right, yeah. Come on. <laughs> and they, you know, they're so gracious, man. These little kids, they just forget and they just move on and they move forward. And you're just like, yeah. you know, it, it, you just see, you see God, you know, in, in a thousand different ways through For your sure. kids. And I had no clue. Uh, people got older men used to tell me all the time, oh, wait till I have some kids, you know, you see what happened, you know, and. Mm. I had no idea what they were saying. I, I couldn't comprehend it. You know, it just is the way that it is. But of course now I have these little babes and uh, I didn't have any kids, Dennis. You prayed for me to have kids. I know, man. Prayed in your car. Hey, bro, we prayed in your car, dude. I got three kids that's now. That's crazy, bro. I mean, that's a miracle in itself, bro. It's crazy to think where you are, yeah. and where you and Katie is are right now. But yeah. It's amazing what God has done through your lives. You guys are a living testimony. Amen. Crazy, well, crazy. You and Rijay have been a, a, a breath of fresh air to us many times over the years. And uh, we're so thankful. Same and, here, uh, man. Yeah. Vice versa. We should go get some lunch. We should. What I love, Dennis, is that people can't, they probably can't even find you online if they want to, you know? And we do like, what website can they find you on? You know, where can they just not reach out? But probably not. You could probably find them in Orange County somewhere at a coffee shop. If you drive <laughs> around there, you'll probably find them. That's right. Um, but, anyways, Dennis, dude, love you, man. Love you too, bro. Thank you for coming on and uh, thank you for the wisdom. Thanks for being such a good friend and brother all these years. I uh, look forward Likewise. to another, another 40 years. Seriously, I'm looking forward to it, Josh. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.